Hi there, my name's Andrew and welcome to The Creative Endeavor, the podcast bringing you inspiring stories from creative professionals from around the world. And in this episode, I've got Miles Johnston on the show. Now, I am a huge fan of Miles' work. He does some exceptional, exquisite drawings and paintings that are not only well executed, but they're so rich with meaning. Every time I look at his work, I feel that I'm questioning something about myself and exploring some things that really are within me and resonate with me. And I know this is true for so many other people out there. He's got a huge following with over 530,000 followers on Instagram. Now again, I know it's not a numbers game, but that kind of following you know that somebody is doing something right. And I wanted to know all about how he makes it work on social media, how he makes it work as a business, but also what makes him tick creatively. This was a really fun conversation. We drilled deep into all kinds of topics and it went for well over two hours. Now I got a lot out of this conversation and it's my hope that you will too. So without further ado, here's Miles Johnston in The Creative Endeavor. Well, Miles, welcome to the Creative Endeavor podcast. It's an absolute pleasure to meet you. I want to do a deep dive into all sorts of things because I can see an enormous amount of depth in your work. But let's just kick things off by having you tell us a little bit more about yourself, your personal story, and what has led you up to this point so far. Okay. Um, well, yeah, my name my name is Miles. I am... I'm 26 now, so I was born in 93, and I've been doing art, I guess, like professionally, technically, since I was about 17, but I wasn't, you know, I did some gigs then, but I've been really trying to um, learn art seriously since I was about 13. I got involved, uh, so I like, I, I'm from England. I grew up a bit. Uh, some of my childhood was spent out in Southeast Asia, like my... Uh, Dad worked in Borneo, so I lived there for a few years when I was young and uh, moved back to the UK and kind of grew up and went to school there. And now I live in Teach Out in Sweden, and I suppose I work full-time as an artist somehow. Or, yeah, I teach as well. I do some part-time teaching at an atelier. And um, so I feel like like my story with art, like so many... People who do art, I've been doing it for as long as I can remember. I've always been sort of like the kid who would draw. But I, about age 13 was when I sort of discovered um, that you could actually get good and do it as a job sort of voluntarily. I think before that point, I felt like it was uh, either, you know, you'd kind of missed the age of being really good at painting or it was, I, I guess I'd never really thought about it in that way you don't think about many aspects of the world when you're a kid. I'd never really thought about how anyone got as good at painting as you would see in a museum or whatever. But um, yeah, my in was through like video games, played a lot of games as a teenager. And I think I was playing like Unreal Tournament. And uh, I would would always like before that age, me and my friends would like copy a lot of drawings out of PlayStation magazines and stuff. And um, or like copy DVD covers. I have like a memory of sketching Keanu Reeves off the front of a pirated Matrix DVD, that kind of, you know, high level art training. And um, I think I saw in one of the booklets that um, this guy was credited as a concept artist. And so I Googled concept art and found this forum called conceptart.org. And um, this must have been like 2006 and was pretty blown away by the quality of the work on there and slowly got into posting. My first year was a bit on and off, you know, such a long story as with anyone for really learning to draw. But from about 2007 onwards, it kind of stuck as a daily habit and um, just kind of got really hooked on the feeling of getting better at something. And I think that was kind of what I fell in love with before I had any real aspirations or plans about how it would become a career. It was just 
finding sort of like a path, you know, was, was good for me. An endeavor, a creative endeavor. <laughs> That's it, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I absolutely love it when the guest can work the title of the show into the podcast somehow. It's just beautiful. <laughs> Makes a really nice sound grab. So thank you. Uh, checks in the mail. Um, <laughs> That that's so interesting. I I too had a um, a real strong interest, you know, in, in concept art. Whenever you're watching a movie or playing a video game, I I, I don't think you know the artists certainly would would realize this, but I don't think the the grumpy parents of children playing video games really know how much actual work goes into a video game. The concept art alone, the environments, the characters all of those aspects, even the design of the gameplay itself. It's extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah. And um, I think I always, you know, growing up, uh, I grew up with an older brother. I still have an older brother, but, you know, it's cool. like your roommate for the beginning of your life. And, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, like a huge amount of our relationship was just around consuming of various creative outputs, whether it was bonding through musical taste or... Um, through games and films and books, whatever. But I feel like we're very much raised in a household where that kind of stuff was not so much the video games, but definitely, you know, I remember my, my mom is great at, um, she's a good painter. And it was always a thing with her that, you know, they wouldn't want us to spend too much time on the computer or whatever. But if what we were doing on the computer was creative, then it was like always fine. You know, even if it was just like, when I was way younger, I used to like making pixel art and trying to make little pixel art animations and stuff. And it was and basically anything was, you know, you'd be left alone if you were making something. That was something my mom would always, now that I think about it, a really nice lesson that she would put into us. You know, you're never wasting your time if you're creating something. She was much more suspicious of just consuming things, except books. <laughs> you can read as many of them as you want. <laughs> But yeah, you know, should be happy to see us. Um, I mean, like, yeah, me and my brother used to keep little notebooks where we'd write, do a lot of writing, and it's just a fun sort of creative household to grow up in. That's fantastic. It's, it's funny. I'm so used to asking other people about their lives, and now you're asking me. It's it's actually kind of hard to. Yeah, but maybe we should mention you. You you have you have a podcast as well uh, called the Miles Files. I've caught a couple of episodes of that, and it's a, a deep dive into other artists and their process and lives and, and you know, their story. And, um, yeah, I, I, I gather it must be weird to have the, you know, the roles reversed a little bit here. But I do really appreciate getting the chance to, to you know, speak with you and meet with you and, and connect. Yeah, connect on an, on an art level. You know, when... When I'm hearing that uh, about your story from your childhood and kind of being bounced around the world a little bit, I, I don't know. Uh, hopefully I'm not projecting too much here, but I, I reflect a, a bit of that story because with my parents and, and their job and my, my, when my father remarried, he married a zoo veterinarian. So that caused us to go from the United States to New Zealand, from New Zealand to Australia. And now that I'm old enough to make my own decisions, I decided to come back to New Zealand. So... I found for me that moving around so much and, and having that puts enormous strain on my social life as a kid, having to start over again, it just caused me to go inside and, and focus on myself and my creativity. How did you find that kind of upheaval as a child? Do you think that fueled your art? I, I do think, it, I do think the um, having lived abroad fueled aspects of my art, but uh, not in that way. Because I feel like basically I I was there from like four to seven and then moved back and then had one solid period until I left home. So I feel like I actually had quite, you know, quite a long time to build up friendships apart from the normal, you know, going to different high schools and that kind of stuff. But um, I do think, I mean, it's hard to say for sure, but when I reflect on at that sort of age, having gone and lived somewhere else uh, that was like, I mean, definitely the Brunei is a strange place. I mean, it's been in the news for pretty terrible reasons recently with the sort of very anti LGBT laws and stuff. But um, growing up, you know, you're in a you're in a bubble, and I'm just in sort of like the the uh, British expat community. There, I feel like it was a mixture of English people, Australian people, and 
Chinese people, and then and yeah, and they were sort of we were all in a international bubble, quite separate from the local population there. But um, I guess the point I was going to make is that um, having lived somewhere very different at that early age, I remember moving back and f- finding it very difficult to um, feel a sen- sense of belonging to my cultural identity in the same way other people did. I never really felt very English. I think from the outside, that sounds maybe kind of ridiculous to other people. But internally, like whether it was... Um, yeah, I just remember having like a bizarre experience of because I went to very a secular school, an international school, and I remember the first sort of Christmas I was back in the UK, and I didn't know any of the Bible stories that everyone else knew, and just small like details like that would, um, or just when people would you know like I made that cheesy joke about having my tea earlier, but that kind of thing is exactly what like has bugged me my whole life of like I've never felt. Um, any sense or desire to identify with, you know, say like my nationality or something like that. Mm. Right. Does that make any sense? Uh, no. I've never felt relevant or descriptive or anything to it, my sort of sense of self. It, it, no, well, it makes total sense to me. Um, again, being an American, I, I don't feel particularly American. The only thing that I have that's American is this slight twang to my accent, but even Americans can't place me, especially Texans. Um, and I don't have, you know, a lot of the aspects of American culture. Mind you, when you say American culture, that's pretty broad and, and diverse itself. It's hard to pin that down. Or is it South or is it North, East, West? Um, so yeah, I, I, I definitely have felt culturally not knowing where i fit in but also you know when you when you observe other cultures like you know as you're saying with you and and brunei you know with me being here in in new zealand even there's a strong cultural identity particularly with with maori people they've they've got a, a fantastic pride for their culture and, and that heritage is preserved i witnessed a bit of that in in australia with aboriginal culture but i always felt very much like an outsider looking in and not really knowing who I was, what was my identity. And maybe, I don't know. So uh, again, tell me, tell me if, if you can relate to this, but for me, I felt that made me again, go even more inside and try and work out, okay, who am I? What does make me tick? Maybe it's not a cultural thing, but maybe it's something else. It drove me through to, to really find and seek out my inspiration. For me, it was landscape. That was my foot in the door with my art. I wanted to see magnificent landscapes. And I guess drawing on some cultural roots there, I, I, I wanted to paint in the tradition of the 19th century European masters. So that was just me. Yeah. I want to put a little... Uh, so many things I want to say. It's like one little disclaimer is that I, I feel like I have to be a little skeptical of my my sense of feeling like I don't have an obvious cultural identity. Um, I feel like could very easily be a blind spot in that uh, because so much of media growing up focused on people who just happen to look like me, you know, in that it is very like... Um, being in the sort of like growing up in a culture where you are where your identity does feel like what is normalized in the media I think it's very easy to be blind to the fact that you have one so I guess I want to say I'm not even I'm not necessarily saying that in a way that I think I'm above it or beyond it so much as it's never registered for me and then another thing um it wasn't, it wasn't so much like the even just cultural customs, but part of the experience that was so that I think has affected my like aesthetic interests and like artistic direction a bit is that it's like the really small things like realizing that on somewhere else in the world, um, you know, grass feels different when you're barefoot, like the grass in Southeast Asia is like a bit harsher and sharper and, and it's different and that the, the trees are different and the street signs are different and the sunsets look different and the way it rains is different. And I think something that it instilled in me very early on is this sense of um, that nothing is a permanent fixture of reality, that it's there's this kind of if you if you grow up in one place in one situation, 
and and you sort of get used to the it's amazing what we will consider as um you know inherently a part of the world that is that is actually just a very local expression and i and i think um i think maybe that's something that stuck with me a lot as well it's just a, a sense that uh nowhere is the normal place does that make any sense uh, totally absolutely you know i and i again i i I even see that reflected in your art. Let's let's jump into the art aspect um, because there's so many things that I'm, I'm dying to ask you. Again, when I was looking at your your Instagram and then went onto your website, you do some amazing work. It's not only technically well executed, but you really have got me thinking about a lot of things. And I, I appreciated so much this one line in your bio where you said my art means anything that you want it to mean and kind of putting the onus back on the viewer and going hey what do you feel when you look at my work I, i'll tell you just now you know what, what i feel when i look at your work that that permanence of reality as as you were you know saying just now i kind of look at it and go you know, it, it's almost like time, space, and reality melt when I look at your, your <laughs> work. It's, it makes me feel incredibly uncomfortable, incredibly Thank uneasy. You. All of this is, because, I like this. <laughs> because what you're doing is you're pointing, you're pointing your finger and it's like you're pushing the button and saying, what the way you interface with reality, it is a veil. And at any moment, it could just dissolve and it's gone, you know? And and so our handle on what is reality, our handle on uh, even our relationship to ourself, there, there's, I look at it, there's, there's a painting that you have there of a girl falling into her own shadow. And to me, that looks like it, it talks about that that relationship with self as well. I'm I'm going to stop rambling here. I want you to tell us all about your work. In, yeah, in as, I mean, as much detail as you like. So one thing that's always, I, I think this is the most fun part of asking asking artists about like why they do stuff because people's answers are so different, right? Like some people will, some people it's almost like an they have a sort of ethic that you don't talk about it that something is lost through talking. Cause when, yeah, that thing where I said, um, you know, what, what you like, you don't want to, I don't want to dampen the audience's, uh, ability and like imperative to try to take part in the experience of looking at a piece of artwork. Um, cause I, I think I, I, I try to really zoom out at this point in my life. And I haven't always like thought this way, but when I think about making artwork, I try to think about what there is in common between like all different forms of um, human creative expression, whether it's uh, a piece of theater, a great meal, uh, a piece of like dance, music, uh, painting, books, whatever. Like what is the kind of common ground be between all of these different things? And the way I view it is that um, the game we're all sort of playing, which is a totally open game is we're just filling, you know, the, the real medium is another human being's attention. Um, you know, when one of my drawings in a room with no one looking at it, to the way I think about the world doesn't exist in any meaningful way in that moment. It's not being, you know, beheld. It's just atoms on paper. It's, you know, it's, uh, the, it, ta it takes the participation of a, of a sort of conscious, of a, of a consciousness looking at a piece of artwork or hearing a piece of music to um, bring it into being, which I think is the same thing that we're doing with reality, uh, you know, every moment as you are looking at a sunset, that beautiful experience of a sunset is happening. You know, it's an active creation between you and this whole complicated system, you know, you can argue the rest of the universe. But when I, when I make a piece of artwork, I think the thing to, rem and I do think it's important to remember it a little bit is that, whatever people get way too caught up in rules about what art has to be about or what genre they're in or, and, and these come from various reasons, normally anxious concerns about what they think other people will like, which normally comes down to what they think will sell or an art director will want to buy. You know, it's like too soon you've involved. Um, how am I going to turn this into a functioning living? 
And for me, we're like when I'm when I'm actually making the work, um, the really special stuff has to come from a place of just asking myself the question, like what is worth paying attention to? Like what do I what do I want to see? What do I want to say? Um, because that those are really ultimately the interesting questions and the things that make us interested in someone else's work. It's not it's not just how good the technique is. Technique to me is a vehicle. It's the kind of finesse. It's how well you can, um, and maybe how powerfully and stylishly or elegantly or whatever. It's it's that little personal touch on how you point point the finger. But the uh, the work of art itself has to be. I mean, in the end, we we can't do anything except remix and reflect uh, reality itself. You know, if I if I make a piece of artwork and it summons some emotion inside of you, let's say it makes you feel sad. Like, I'm not so arrogant as to claim I invented sadness. You know, like that feeling, that fe- that feeling that can feel so special and meaningful to connect with was already in the other person. I've just tried to come up with um, something that gives them the context to access that. So so I, I feel like we're always just kind of, like every artist is doing this a kind of strange and magical position in society of literally being the person looking back and just going like, you know, isn't life weird or like, isn't it sad? Isn't it funny? Like, you know, like, and you, you're just there asking people to pay attention to it and that, and that's it. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's an odd, it's a really strange way to make a living, especially if you get to the point, like you say you're doing now where there's no art directors, there's no, like if you can get to a point where you can just make the artwork you want, I think the reason that so classically, you know, artists get a bit weird, especially if you combine that with any level of success and enablement of your sort of, you know, ego to do what it wants. But you, you really are left with the kind of question of like, um, I think it's the same question as like, what makes a good life? You know, it's like, what's worth paying attention to? Uh, what feels important to you? And, and that's just such a heavy uh, almost paradoxical question. So, yeah, I guess I just try to be honest would be the most, cause I don't, cause I don't know how to te- answer what's important. I, I kind of work on an ethic of just trying to, um, if I can express really honestly how I'm feeling in a moment, even if it's kind of, um, you know, ultimately, you know, not, not even something that I intellectually stand behind there's a kind of truth to just an honest expression of a feeling or a thought. Do you know what I mean? It's like just trying to dissolve that boundary between people as well. So mm. there were a bunch of different things there. <laughs> wow. wow! You know, there was a lot there. And again, I, I love what you're saying about the viewer bringing to it their own meaning almost and you're pointing out so the 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 act of interfacing with with the artwork it it's a recognition thing with with your viewer it's like oh okay i, I remember now and i i dig that so much and you know you've even caused me as you were saying that then it's kind of like oh yeah that's what i need to be paying attention to i do find myself kind of wrestling with this theme of catering to an audience, painting what they want to see, but at the same time, trying to maintain authenticity. And it's almost an impossible task. I feel like when you really hit your stride and you're really flowing with the artwork, by paying attention honestly, as, as you're saying here, by paying attention honestly to, to what you want to say, I, I think that's the only way to hit the right triggers with your audience anyway. But you can't, it's almost like you have to put that out of your mind completely. No, you so, got it. Yeah. The, the part of you that wants to win the game of approval and praise and work working online. Ironically, the only way that piece gets to win is by, I think in the long run is by actually doing the hard work of shutting that stuff out temporarily. And it is hard that I feel, especially for young artists today, the deck is so stacked against you. Like these technologies and social media are so, you know, dangerously addictive. And I think if we had a better understanding of, um, 
you know, neuroscience, they, there would be something about the way they function that is revealed as quite clearly pathological. But at the same time, I'm not, I'm not a sort of Luddite. I think, um, I've met tons of great friends and found so much good artwork and had like, you know, really all the success with my art career through social media as well. So I think it is this difficult tightrope to walk, but, you know, especially when I was younger, when I was like, when I was like 17, 18, you know, I had this one summer where I went through like a, you know, my first real breakup and where I was like, spending too much time on Facebook and just, I had this one summer where I was like, enough is enough. I, th- I think I downloaded some programs that would block, um, it was something called cold Turkey that could block websites on your laptop. And I blocked like YouTube, Reddit, Facebook, like everything. I had everything blocked for a full two weeks. It was just inaccessible on the computer. And I would do this two weeks at a time. I would literally shut it, shut it down. And I would just go into art hibernation mode. I'd do nothing but just draw all day, and hang out with like one of my closest friends when I needed to like socialize. And then I would turn it on after two weeks and it would be like, oh, nothing's changed, post some art and then put it on for another two weeks. And I think, I reckon I would have trouble doing that now. And I would, I think if you're out, I think the annoying thing for me is that I, I have, I've developed this sense that I have an obligation to, yeah, like, like I'm well and truly duped by the game as much as anyone else, but I think I need to test it and, and realize that like, um, you know, I need to test the assumption that people will lose interest if I disappear for a while. Cause I feel like I, I hope I'm at a point where like I could disappear for six months. And if I came back with work that was better for it, maybe that would be something worth doing. I don't know. Hmm. It might be, but, but um, I mean, it's a tall order. I, I, I get it. They, the, I don't want to, I don't want to misquote this, but I, I, I think it was an ex director of Facebook, not Mark Zuckerberg, but an ex director or somebody high up anyway, um, who was very much integral in setting up Facebook came out, uh, in recent years and admitted, yeah, we, we made it socially uh, you know, addictive. We made it psychologically addictive for a reason, the color, the sound of the pop, the, or the, the ding and all of these things We're we're caught then in a feedback loop. And as a creator posting to the platform, whether it's Facebook or Instagram, which is owned by Facebook, you do get caught. And I find myself getting caught up in, what are people going to say? Like I, I make a post, let me check who's commented. Let me reply to that. And, you know, and then the opposite side of the coin, you know, somebody like a Gary Vaynerchuk, who I really like listening to from a business standpoint, you know, he's talking about, you got to get in there and interact with all these people. I find sometimes that makes it even worse. It pulls me out of myself, but you've got to, you could, it, this is a big ask for you. And I, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but you're, you're sitting on 530 thousand people following you right now on Instagram. Wow. And and so I can, I can feel that that would create an enormous amount of pressure to constantly show up because all of these people are going, me want, me want, me want, come on, post. When's the next next coin? I I just think it's given me a little bit of perspective. Um, People live way weirder lives, you know, like having like a large Instagram account there's nothing on like people who are sort of, you know, known in a way that impacts the way they can be in public or anything like that. But, um, I mean, you, anything is nor- like your brain will normalize anything and your expectations will rise in a way that is actually like embarrassing upon any kind of introspection, you know, that, that kind of game of feeling like, um, you know, if, if you finally win the game of having a lot of followers, the worrying part of your mind will start to obsess about whether or not it's still growing or shrinking or whether the engagement's as good as it was a month ago or whether these posts are, it's like you, you just kind of discover new benchmarks that becomes the new normal. And then if some, something's underperforming or overperforming, and I found it, it truly is a sort of hedonic treadmill where when I used to post on a forum and refresh the next day and two people had left a comment, that shit felt so good. (laughs) And to be honest, like, you know, like 50,000 likes on an image and a few hundred comments, it feels exactly the same because practically you don't have the time to, um, you, the problem is there's the sense that I can't allow myself to, if there is something good to be 
felt from that, you know, if there's some sense of self-esteem or whatever, it ends up just detracting from the work that needs to be done of making the next image. Like I've had this experience several times of like, if you start to believe your own hype and you start to, yeah, you know, the next time you sit down to draw, I think that's what's helpful about doing drawing for a living. This is kind of inherently humbling because it doesn't matter if something's getting a bunch of buzz online or if you feel good, you'll sit down in front of the sketchbook the next day and you'll draw the stupidest foot you've ever seen. And you, you just kind of know with yourself, like, I think it, it helps it helps that the attention comes from something that I know legitimately in my heart I've worked on for countless hours. Like I feel like when someone says like, I love your, I love your work. I feel like I can, I can say thank you and mean it and know that it's for something like it, it works because it's grounded in something that I, yeah. I mean, I can't overstate, especially for like young artists. Like, um, I mean, like I've like really put in the work on this and just like found a lot of time to do it and been, you know, as, as well as a mixture of tremendous luck and support and all of that stuff. But um, yeah, it is weird. I, I don't even like talking about it. I feel, I feel somehow I, I feel the sense that if I was listening to me, I would be judging me. Like, do you know what I mean? No, no, I, I know, ex- I know exactly what you mean, but we're, this, I mean, Again, I appreciate you being so open and honest with me because I feel that these are some of the things that that need to be discussed and explored, um, especially from people like yourself who, you know, you're living, breathing this experience. I think you'd be able to shed a lot of light on it. We measure our success via all of these things that are external. Uh, let's take this this podcast, for instance. I, I had a relatively still still have it's still growing a, a relatively large YouTube following and and I love my subscribers dearly I, I I'm so grateful to them that they would want to watch and listen to what I have to say and I was getting consistently you know several thousand views tens of thousands of views for my typical how to paint tutorials and videos you know exploring all sorts of technical aspects as soon as a podcast dropped though. I got a real mixed reaction and suddenly I'm going from, you know, over 50,000 views to now under 10. And initially my ego took a real hit and I was like, oh, and, you know, I was talking to my wife about this and she was like, you know what, you need to just do what you do and be true to yourself, genuinely true to yourself. And through that authenticity, you're going to reach the right people. And I started thinking, okay, well, what is it? It's not about the external dings and pops and all this positive reinforcement and the dopamine rush that I'm getting from you know these external things. It's about scratching the creative itch that I have within. And I think through that, what's happening is now, even though it's fewer followers with the podcast, the followers that I have listening to these conversations, when they reach out, I feel it's like it's a genuine exchange. And now yeah. I'm starting to kind of, that's, yeah. That's the thing with the internet and scale is it's convinced all of us that scale is this inherent, um, inherently good thing. Um, and it's kind of, it's kind of weird. Like if I, if I had, you know, if you have a best friend, like I have like a friend who I've known for a long time, been really close, kind of learned to draw together. Shout out Sam Carr. But you know, like a good conversation with him, it's like, I never have the feeling like, oh God, I wish I had this conversation with 10,000 people (laughs) instead of just one. Like, like in some sense, I think these metrics and these numbers have become a kind of, um, what's the fancy word I want to drop? from an article I read the other day. It's going to come to me later, but they've become a sort of substitute for um, just like, yeah, like, you know, self-esteem or uh, belonging to a community or the connections that I think, I believe we all have this kind of inherent uh, wiring to expect to be a part of everyday life. You know, we're an organism that developed in a situation just you know, we're highly adaptable, but, um, at our core, you know, we're adapted to a very different way of living. And I I feel like civilization and sort of the impact of language has happened in a lightning flash compared to hundreds of millions of years of these kind of, you know, neural architecture slowly being developed and formed. And, and I think 
the kind of accelerated pace of technology, it's just, it's an unusual time to be a human being, you know, and it's, uh, I mean, I, I also want to say, like, don't get me wrong, like, um, and I think this is where it gets difficult. This is where it gets especially difficult for me. Like if the relationship I have to Instagram, um, the addictive quality of it and those kind of things, if I, I talk with my girlfriend about this sometimes because she's like, um, she's really good at like, if she feels like she's on her phone too much, she'll just like delete the apps for a few weeks. She's just like, she'll just suspend her accounts for a while. doesn't care. And quite happy to sort of like know when to pull back. But I feel like because my income and living is sort of blended in there with, uh, so, so, you know, so thoroughly with the platform, I, I sort of feel like, um, I feel like for me, it's a calculation that's like worth it at this point and is a, a net positive, you know, it's a net positive thing. Um, well, I, I do want to, I want to circle back it's, it's really weird in a way. I feel like I'm, I feel like I have become a character and I'm no longer a real person. And it's, there's this weird separation between the image that other people have of me in their head and who I actually am. The only person that really, really knows me besides myself is my wife. And it's just something I struggle with. Um, it's it's been the most the most positive experience in my life being online, sharing my work with other people. But at the same time, the most it's it's like this disassociative disorder kind of thing. It's mm. it's like that ain't me. That ain't me. You know. Oh, and I my mean, paintings. I remember the word now from earlier, and you'll love this. Sorry, oh. but it it was what you were talking about. Um, was a small sort of independent magazine. I, I got a call two years ago from a guy who was like, oh, I'm like an engineer at Google and I'm, I'm looking to start like a little uh, magazine that's going to be sort of talking about um, technological issues from a sort of, you know, mostly leftist but technologically informed perspective. And I was like, interesting, you know, yeah, let's have a long call. And um he wanted to use a bunch of artwork to illustrate an essay he'd written. And the essay was about that. It was like self, the simulacrum self. And I like that word, a simulacrum being something that is kind of like a, a pale imitation or a, a sort of substitute that's maybe lacking in some um, essential substance. But what you were just talking about as feeling online as the kind yeah, the self simulacrum is exactly what the essay was about, which is that, you know, we, when you look at your profile of yourself and these weird quantifiable metrics and the identity we put online is there's this unusual relationship where the simulacrum self that we've created starts to affect the behavior of the real self because we mm -hmm. start to do things for it it's to feeds provide into it with itself. content. Yeah. yeah, to provide mm -hmm. it with content. And then it starts to be changing who we are and then it's changing the image. And so he, that image of mine where it's like the girl with the light and face flipping backwards and forwards he wanted to use and a lot of the feedback loops that he was like looking at in his essay, he felt like the artwork would sit alongside and just what you were saying back then. But this, this one was called Dichotomy and it was about, you know, it's like the sequence has two different light sources um on each, so i feel like this to me it was like two, two different selves reflecting back and forth so this was oh, the, yes. the yeah. image that went alongside it and um but i loved that idea of, yeah that we've created a fake version of ourselves that we that has started to have a kind of feedback loop and the feedback loop is changing everything he said you know it's changing public spaces and it's changing how Instagram is changing how people interact with the world and group behavior. And uh, like you saw that super bloom in California where like the flowers bloom up everywhere. And then like thousands of people came in and trampled these fields because everyone wanted the right picture with the flower fields. And um, wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, and if, you, if you stand around in public and you see people go in galleries and take a selfie in front of a painting and sort of barely look at the painting and, you know, those kind of, so it's sort of, it was interesting to me to like talk about, yeah, that idea of um, the relationship between our digital simulacra and our real self. And I should give them a shout out. They're called a protein, 
protein, like a pro T E A N and they're like a very small independent mag and it, it was pretty cool from what I've seen. So fantastic. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, I mean that that's that's kind of a, a little bit, of, and I hope people out there don't mind me me saying that. It's by no way uh, I'm I'm not ungrateful for the position that I've been I find myself in now um, of being able to interact with so many people and actually be helpful. I'm trying to be as helpful as possible because I just feel that that's what I needed back when there was nobody there. And, and, but at the same time, I, I had a few mentors that I am grateful for. So it's this weird kind of mix of wanting to, to give back. Um, but, but in that, with the constant um, pressure of having to put something out, you, you do find you start associating with something that isn't you. And, and you're, you bamboozle yourself now and again by saying, well, no, that maybe that is me no no and and so that voice gets louder and louder and, and it's like no that 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 ain't me from talking about external factors social media addiction and these things that scratch the the ego but not the deeper self um still people out there want to know okay there is there is power in this medium there's an ability to reach a lot of people and there's ability from just a practical, tangible business sense to make this work and interface with those people. And, and, and so it's, I think then it becomes a question of, of how to manage that. Um, so if you don't mind for, from here, uh, actually, you know what? No, actually, I have, yeah, I have, I have a real, I have something that I feel like might be a good take on this. Cause I yeah, think go on, please, point, please. Which is that I think, I think one thing that's super important for people to remember, because I know I know a lot of people out there feel like they're stuck on this kind of um, this insane treadmill. You know, when you can't make it out of small Instagram page hell, where every day is sort of getting followed and unfollowed by people using automatic scripts and all the comments are just like fantastic feed. I thought maybe you'd like to check out my gallery. You know, there's that kind of low. Like I think the platform at the moment provides a really a really hollow experience for small accounts. And I think the honest truth is um, growing like, um, and this is this, not just the same on Instagram, but like anywhere in the world, um, creating a sort of following for your artwork is not like, it's not like grinding on an RPG where you're just going to get one follower a day. And if you just do this for the next million years, you're going to suddenly have a few million followers. It's like when things grow online or when, when things spread in culture, they, they can spread quite quickly when you found the right strategy and when you're ready for that. So I feel like a lot of people who are, pro are probably just in a phase where they're kind of not, they're not at a place yet where it's the right kind of space to be in. Like when, when I was like, for the first 10 years of when I was making art, when I was on forums, everything about that online space felt catered for where it was in my art journey. If you'd given me the platform I had now, you know, 10 years ago, it would have just ruined my art career. There's absolutely no way I would have kept up the same disciplined work habits, um, would have learned the same lessons, would have had the same space to explore. It would have been a it would have been a disaster, and I think for a lot of people, the thing they think they want would just be it would be terrible for their development as an artist. I think it, I used to enjoy this feeling that I was there in my sort of in my bedroom. Nobody knew what I was working on, and I was just there learning things and studying. And I felt I felt like I was working on this little private inner universe that I was sort of getting shaping you know ready to share with the world and um it, i think i think it's a little sad because there aren't spaces that or at least they're not as big as they used to be i don't know if there are forums nowadays but i don't really know what the what the best space would be for a learning artist because social media tends to i'm kind of of the opinion that someone whose work is um sort of ready to have an audience can come out of nowhere and it will, you know, at first it'll take a while, but it will still sort of organically grow over time. Um, 
so normally it's that strategy of, you know, strategy, what do I want to say? The problem, the problem is normally not a broken algorithm or that the feed isn't chronological or any of the stuff. It's, it's normally just that the honest truth is like, we live in a world where there's like infinite things for people to pay attention to. And it's very hard to make something that's going to be memorable or interesting to people in that space. You know, it's, it requires like a huge amount of dedication to get the skills ready. And then it requires a huge amount of introspection and thought and um, persistence and everything. Hmm. Does that make any sense? No, it, you know, it does. It does. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I, again, you're, you're giving me so much there, so much food for thought miles. Um, and there's a lot to unpack there. I, I often, I, I, well, I do it for every episode. I get the chance to go back and listen again. And um, this is one that I'm going to look forward to listening to again and again and again. I, um, I would love to just, th- there's a drawing that I want to ask you about. Um, and again, I know that your, your position on the, the meaning behind the work is, is something that the viewer brings to the work. Um, oh, but I'm happy and, to. Sh- I, I'm happy to tell you my side. You know. Yeah, I, I'd love to hear your side. I'll, I'll tell you what the drawing means to me. Now, I, look, I'm going to put it up to the screen. I don't know if this is going to work, but um, I don't see. Oh, titled "The Shadow." Okay. Uh, ah, yeah. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I don't know what it is about this drawing. <laughs> there we go. This drawing. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I don't. I don't know what it is about that drawing, but when I look at it. It's subtle. It's subtle the way it's done. Technically, your work is phenomenal. It's beautifully rendered. It's gorgeous. And again, I know that's just the vehicle, but the first thing that I gravitate towards is, ooh, pretty picture. But then what you do is, you know, that's the hook. And then while yeah, it's there, there's there's this thing to wrestle with in your mind. The shadow in for the people listening to this, it's a it's a drawing of a young girl laying on the ground in in the rain it would appear there's puddles all around her and fallen leaves and there's a strong sense of directional light coming from above and she's casting a shadow she's got one hand on her chest the other hand up and she's casting a shadow on the ground and the shadow trails off her face as as in streams of light and it's almost like she's melting into the very ground itself and to me I don't know what it is about me, but th- to me that this is that is so haunting and yet so beautiful. It talks about this idea that I was wrestling with a few years ago about this illusion of separation, where we feel like we are a separate entity. That I, you know, hello, I'm Andrew, and I make art, and I'm now walking down here, and, but. What when you actually physically you, you think about it, you 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 go into this as a deeper level, you realize there is no separation between yourself and the world that you're interacting with, that literally everything is a soup of atoms and we're all connected. And that goes even further in terms of consciousness. I, I'm a big believer that consciousness is not separated. Consciousness is shared. So here in this conversation, you're an expression of the exact same consciousness here. And we're having a conversation mm-hmm. fooling hmm. ourselves that we're different people. Hmm. And yeah. to me, and, and that, okay. And a lot of people out there listening to this would be go, Andrew, stop smoking that stuff. Listen, I, 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 when I look at that picture, when I look at that picture, I just, I, I feel like you've reminded me of something that I knew on a soul level. I just want to, I want to, yeah, I love it. And to the people who feel this allergic reaction, cause I, I get it too. I get why people are, I made a decision a long time ago. I'm just going to talk about the things I find interesting, whether or not they make me seem kind of dorky or whatever, but like, that's that is what drives so much my art you know it's take just take a second to if you're hearing my voice right now you're alive you exist you know you're here in this present moment and you cannot think back as far as you can um eventually it kind of fades into a uh fades into fades into a blur you know there's only so far back we can remember and we all know there's a 
seeming end date on this experience and we don't know when it began really what's going on or where we are and i think it's a really weird cultural norm to sort of um look down on talking about those ideas as if they're not interesting but uh everything you sort of it's fun to hear people talk about stuff and it's very satisfying to hear you pick up on ideas i want to get across in my artwork that I, you know, it's, it's not even like I'm trying to put them in there because I wouldn't know how it's just so interesting to me that the fact that those are things I care about clearly comes across in enough of a way that you're able to pick up on it. I couldn't even tell you why Th you know, things like the, a belief in a sort of, um, or at least an interest in the idea that, you know, maybe there's no, this uh, idea of being separate from the universe as a kind of some sort of illusion we're not able to quite wrap our heads around. But um, for this particular piece, I, I never start a piece. I mean, I don't want to say never. It's probably happened once or twice, but I, I don't ever sort of sit down and say, um, you know, I don't, I don't sit around thinking and writing and trying to come up with... Um, it's funny after I said, yeah, what do you want to say? That my process never really involves thinking about what I want to say. It, it happens the other way around. I tend to just have sketchbooks where um, I just let myself kind of free associate, draw. You know, I'm just kind of drawing things, thumbnailing. Um, I'll often, some of my favorite ideas have come from sitting down on days where I feel exhausted like i have nothing to say like everything is going to turn out bad and i'll just kind of sit down i'll say well if you don't you know if, if you can't think of what to draw just draw a head or just draw a pose you can think of or draw some action and then that'll turn out kind of crappy but i'll see something i like and it normally comes from exploring and then coming back to pages i, I like to do these pages of maybe like some interesting poses or half an idea but i don't know how to finish them and then the next time i sit down and have some sketching time I go and sort of maybe we'll combine bits of those things or draw on top of them. And, and I kind of am just waiting for, um, there's a certain kind of feeling when I see a sketch and I just kind of know, like, I couldn't tell you why, but that has something that I'm interested in right now. And I think a big part of how, uh, why a lot of my work becomes a little bit, um, has a certain intensity to it like that is that, um, by default, it's a lot of work for me to not fall into this kind of, I don't want to call it like a nihilism, but I, I have this kind of setting towards finding, you know, like in my weirder moments, I'm the kind of person to stand in front of like a really beautiful sunset and just be like, so what, <laughs> you know, like I, I, I have this thing where I, I will often be left feeling and not always, but it's in there in me, this sense of, uh, the desire to find things that feel meaningful and connect me to love and other people and a, a sense of, yeah, slipping out of this kind of ignorance I can slip into, this sort of ignoring how beautiful the world is. Um, I feel like that desire is so, because I can fall into that so easily, it really motivates me to make artwork because this is kind of my attempt to... Um, to try to find that meaning and connection. So this idea, this drawing came out of, um, I, I mean, I, it was just a strange kind of time last year, I guess. I, I think it was during the sort of heat wave out here. It was just relentlessly hot every day and, um, you know, everything burnt to a crisp and no rain for about three months. And obviously the heaviness that came from I think, I think it was last year was the time I really realized that, um, the start of paying attention to the fact that, you, you know, we're going to feel the impacts of climate change in our own lifetimes. I think I'd always kind of put it in this box of like, well, that's fucked up, but I'm a techno optimist. Someone's going to figure out how to solve this and, uh, it's not going to happen for like a hundred years anyway. And I feel like I felt this real change in myself in the past few years where I've like started to realize, uh, um, so that's not really what the piece is about, but I think that was the kind of background heaviness, you know, thinking about that sort of collective, um, 
I mean, that's like a heavy place to go, really, if you really think about it. And um, I was also listening to a book called uh, called Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. A great book. I'd really recommend it to people if you want to <laughs> challenge yourself to something that is very dark. But I think I got to such a, um, I was feeling so a little bit bleak and every time I've been feeling good, I put off listening to this book because I thought, you know, I'm feeling great right now. What? I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to listen to accounts from the Holocaust, but, um, somehow I thought, you know, people always say this book has something inspiring. And I thought, um, I had that sense that maybe what I was looking for, I, I had to go into this kind of, uh, I've found in my life, every time I've tried to run away from things that scare me, there's no way to actually run away. There is no running away. Um, it all catches up to us. So I thought I would spend some time going into something like that. And um, the drawing I had started at the time, it started to take on a kind of, because to me, the idea is that the shadow is like this kind of, um, it's like playing with an illusion with uh, light and form and space so it, the idea is i was visualizing the whole area in the shadow if it was uh, sort of deleted and cut through as if going you know I, I like these kind of tunnels and void spaces um that don't you know that sort of fit in in a way that's kind of impossible within you know with you know it's just an idea to me that is conceivable within the imaginary space of a drawing, but doesn't actually make any sense according to, you know, physics or whatever. I love, I love trying to draw stuff like that. I feel like Escher was really good at that where it's sort of like a, a good depiction of the impossible is so satisfying to me, but this kind of shadow tunneling down took on this kind of, um, yeah, this perspective of that sort of inner, well, that potential in, all people, I think, for immense, um, you know, evil. And uh, I think, because I think what worries me more about climate change than anything else is how how people are going to react en masse, politically, socially, personally, in the face of a catastrophe. I feel like it has both the potential to bring out the best and the worst in people. So I suppose it, it, it was just this kind of, I, I still find it, I don't know if you have this, but when you, I used to read history as a kid and just think it was pretty fun. Like, you know, the crazier shit, the better. Oh, I'm not meant to be swearing. Sorry. Yeah, but the, right. the, the older I get and the more I um, read history, the more it just feels like this gigantic disaster. Like it's like things that used to seem funny. Like I just can't believe that people have been, burnt at the stake and tortured alive and experimented on in live vivisection. You know, it's just sometimes I can't believe that this universe that my experience of has been so beautiful. I, you know, just this summer I've been out in nature and swimming in lakes here in Sweden and being in far and the same face of reality that you see in a cute little bunny, in a in a puppy in you know in your lover's face in the sun laughing with your best friends it's the same thing that can be a concentration camp that can be the collapse of a biosphere and what drives me artistically is there's there's something in us that is thrilled by the darkness too the part of the part of you that wants to watch a horror movie is the part of you that can find terror aesthetically interesting when you are when you are removed from the sense that any permanent harm will come to you, when you can enter an experience like a movie and just say, um, "I'm just going to experience this," and then I'm ultimately going to be fine. There's this flip side where even the darkest things ultimately elicit a kind of thrill and joy at being alive. And I guess part of me is interested in exploring darker things because I feel like this this the same obsession with the heaviness in life. You're just like one step away from a realization that could truly make you free, which I think for me is the sense of um, if you can accept reality as it is, as it really is, um, and if you could lose your fear of, if you could just accept the reality that everything is impermanent um, and that even the worst experiences have a, don't last forever, 
there's part of, I think there's something in us at our deepest level that is just thrilled to be experiencing anything at all. So it's like this constant, um, yeah, I guess the reason I, I like exploring all the heavier existential stuff is for me, I'm trying to sort of heal a part of me that is so fascinated with it. You know, maybe I'm trying to see if there's something there to, uh, it's, it's not that like, I feel like when I hang out with my friends and stuff, I, I would rather be the version of me that is just like happy to chit chat about bullshit and not feel the need to ramble about, you know, all the heavy stuff all the time. Part of it just feels kind of insecure fundamentally. You're, you're, you are, you're hitting the right notes for me because I, I, I love thinking about this stuff and tackling this stuff. Not that I understand it, but you know, as you were saying, then it, it, something popped into my mind where when you look at Buddhism and the fundamentals of Buddhism, there's this initial acceptance and understanding that life and reality is suffering. And the Buddhists that I've known in my life, and I've had the you know fortune of, of, of meeting a few of them. Um, they're happy people. They they it's almost like they they get it. Uh, and it's not a I don't subscribe to the whole thing. I I like aspects of it, um, and that's one that's just uh, uh, the nature of reality. I, I I'm afraid to admit. I try to stay on the optimistic side of things, especially with things like you know a heavy topic like climate change. I I feel. And again, I, I, I reflect what you're saying there, where I feel like it brings out the worst in people, but it also tragedies, misfortunes, and these, these hellish events that happen to us throughout our history, they, they have the tendency to bring out the best as well, um, where human beings have got this destructive streak that we've never been able to get rid of. And if we think we have, we're only fooling ourselves, but at the same time, we have this ability to to surprise, to come together, to to love, to nurture, to care, to connect. Um, I, I just I think it's a question of where you put your focus as well. But again, your work, your 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 drawings, your 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 paintings, they they again they they push the button for me. They point at it and they just go, it's here. And and that's what impressed me so much. Yeah, I look at a lot of art on Instagram. I, I'm surrounded by art all the time. I myself, as an artist, am very much into pretty things and landscape things and things where I don't want my viewer to think at all. I don't want to. I don't want to. I I want to move them in a way, I suppose. But I, I'm. I, I just want to paint what I want to paint. But it's it's often just pretty landscapes or a, a pretty portrait, and, and that's it. Yours. Yeah, again, the execution, they're exquisite drawings. There's another drawing here that, that I, I, I want to just kind of touch on because this, you know, when we're talking about our relationships with other people, there's this drawing here, um, which is an ink drawing of, of two lovers embracing or that looks like they're trying to embrace. And her arm is going through his side and his arm is going through her heart and it's not a violent thing it's not a pain thing but it's like they're touching there are two physical objects occupying the same space at the same time which is impossible mm. physically but at the same time it feels like they're they're, they're slightly almost depressed looking melancholic and they've got their heads drooped down and it's almost like this yearning this striving for connection which is an impossible feat it reminds me of, and again, I hope she doesn't mind me saying this, but I, I love my wife dearly. I absolutely adore her. I, 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 I worship her. I, I think she is the best person that I've ever met and, 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 and my, my favorite person ever. And I, I just feel so connected to her. But the more I go into that, how connected am I really? I mean, hmm. I, I can't be in her head. I don't know everything she's thinking at every moment. I don't know that I want to, but I, 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 sometimes you feel like you're just, you're kidding yourself. You're kind of playing a trick on yourself that you are hmm. actually really interfacing with this person when in actual fact, all they're doing is pushing the right external buttons, allowing you to interface with yourself. And it's like, oh yeah, I'm still all alone in the world. That drawing, it's just yeah. a drawing, Miles. It's just a drawing. But that drawing <laughs> reminds me again of the nature of reality. It's, I mean, what everything is just a, just a something, right? You know, it's, um, I, I love that you brought that in. That's like not something so often, um, 
Because I do want to, it's like my primary goal isn't to make people think, it's to make, I would say it's to make people feel if I've really succeeded, is that um, I, w- I want to hit people on that intuitive level. I want you to sort of backpedal and the thinking is trying to understand why something moved you. Do you know what I mean? Like if the thinking comes in, it's like, why did this make me feel sad? You know, and then then you start to break it down or why did this make me feel peaceful or whatever? But um, that's really interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, isn't that isn't that the existential? Who has not had that fear at some point in their lives? Is it is it you know it's the ultimate sort of solipsistic fear? Is it are we able truly to connect with others? I mean, I happen to be of the belief that we absolutely can. I feel like I've had. I don't think I've had any. And I don't think anyone, if they're being sort of truly intellectually honest, has had like irrefutable proof that they've touched on the internal life of someone else. But I've had moments in my life where I the felt sense of connection has been so strong and I've trusted the other people who were in this moment who have said the same thing. But for me, that is enough. Do you know what I mean? It's like I don't need proof. Um, whatever kind of experience I had was... Um, was good enough. It's kind of like the same, it's the same way I feel about free will. I think when I think about free will, ultimately I'm not convinced it's a concept that makes any sense, but it doesn't bug me because whatever I've, I haven't lost anything from how my whole life has been before now, whatever it was that I thought I had, or, you know, it, nothing has changed upon reflecting that but yeah with me this piece was kind of about i suppose um once again it just started kind of from intuitive um sketching it didn't start from often for me the fun part about making a drawing is as as i work on it over a few days or one day or months or however long it takes um is trying to figure out yeah why why am i making this one and and often they end up feeling surprisingly coherent to my, I mean, you know, we're not capable of making random decisions. That's why I believe in the sort of power of like intuitive sketching. If you sit down with a sketchbook and you just start drawing stuff and uh, you draw a bunch of different things and you try to get as free and loose as possible. And, um, and then you just look at one piece here and you say, I don't know what it is about this one, but this is, this is what I got to work on right now. You don't need to understand why that drawing jumped out to you, but it's not a random decision. Um, The fact that that spoke to you and the others didn't must reflect something about your internal state. And I think for me, there's a way of making the decisions where um, when it's mysterious to me, I I don't know why I want to draw this, but this just feels meaningful right now. Those end up being the best ones because it's kind of, um, I'm, I'm involved in with everyone else and being like, why did I make this? <laughs> you know, when I see people saying, why did you draw this? I say, you know, it's just, where, where did that come me. from? Yeah. It's just, that's very thrilling and a fun way to interact with yourself, to learn, to, to really understand that there's a kind of mysterious, and there's parts of yourself that you don't have immediate access to. Yeah. To loop all the way back around and answer your question. I think, you know, I, that piece has become a, to me about, I suppose, like setting boundaries in relationships. So they're in this kind of situation where, um, uh, you know, the ba- the boundary, like you need the boundary of the skin in order to touch someone. To 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 have the sort of closest intimacy, actually relies on this on the body. You know, the the, the bodies passing through each other is the symbol of um, the desire to be closer, grip too tightly. That you know, maybe like a misplaced desire to be closer has led to a situation where, ironically, they're just passing through each other and unable to connect at all. So it's kind of about like maybe, you know, the ego's job of setting. You know, there is such thing as as healthy boundaries and right. and that a sense. You know, that perhaps like totally losing your sense of self doesn't lead hmm. to, you know, maybe that leads to a romantic fling for a while, but it probably. I don't know. I'm not like a relationship counselor, but if I had to, <laughs> if I had to analyze my own drawing, I guess that would be, that would be one way of seeing it. But everything I just did is tell you a story. Like 
it's like if, if we were musicians, right? Um, and I always tell people this, if you, if you listen to instrumental music, uh, you know, you can, we can be all pretentious and say some Beethoven or it could be like some Aphex Twin or a guitar solo or whatever. And then you sat down and he said, you know, well, Mr. Mr. Aphex Twin, Mr. Richard D. James, what was that piece about? It's a nonsensical question. It is a song. It is what it is. And, and the kind of, um, I love playing the game as much as anyone else of telling a story about it and, uh, trying to figure out if it, if it makes me feel anything interesting. And I, I love the fact that art can start discussions like that, but ultimately like it is what it is. And again, Miles, I got to say with your work, I, it's, it's hitting the buttons for me, but it's also identifying that, that inconsistency within myself. So in one sense, I'll look at one of your drawings and it reminds me, oh yeah, everything's connected. There is no separation. Mm -hmm. And then at the, another one, I'll yeah. say, everything's separated. You're <laughs> separate from everyone else. So here I'm thinking, yeah, we're all one consciousness, man. And, and then, and then, you know, the next one reminds me, you're, you're never going to really, truly deeply connect with another person other than yourself. It's, it's so fascinating, mate. It's so fascinating. I feel like there's, yeah, so many, I don't even know what to say to that in the, in just, except for just like a, yeah, <laughs> like I have no idea either. It's weird, isn't it? It, it reminded me of um, a great little tag from, um, I really like this author, Donna Tart. She's only written three novels, but they're all great. I've only read one and a half of them, but it's good enough. I'm in the middle of the other one, but I, um, I just really like her way of writing. And uh, in one of them, there's like a little tagline where one of the characters is having like a memory from childhood and she's remembering like the first time she skinned her knee. I don't know how much I even agree with this, but I just thought it was so beautifully poetic. And she was talking about how um, she always felt like positive emotions were shared together. When everyone was laughing in a room, there was a sense of everybody being in the laughter together. There's a kind of warm, connected buzz to something going well. And she, it writes about how she's, she's crying not only um, because of the physical pain, but at a deeper level, it reminds her that um, like when, when she skins her knee and feels the pain, only she feels the pain and it reinforces the separation from other people. And it's, and it's just, and she doesn't even elaborate on it and it's worded so well. And that's the kind of stuff that makes me like really love a writer's writing. It's like, yeah, there's a story and there's a plot, but when you just, you throw in, this complex little beautifully expressed thought and it's not quite closed enough that it's someone telling you what to think. It's just open enough that it, that it's, it's stuck with me for years. It's like, is that true? Do I think, do I agree with that? And, and then just moving on with the story. I, I love stuff like that. And um, that kind of stuff inspires me artistically with like, yeah, what is a detail that you can put into a drawing? What is a choice you can make? That, um, that gives someone just enough that they think, Did, could he have meant that? But he could have not meant it. Was it an accident? Like where they, where they can't quite see your hand in trying to shape their thoughts, but you're, you're there setting, like everything you put in a piece brings a certain energy with it. It brings um, associations, which you can't control because you don't know what people have seen and been through. It brings... Yeah, I guess I think very much in terms of associations and I, I'm always looking for things that feel like they could um, connect to a, a memory or an experience. You know, that's why I love my, a lot of my characters. It's like, it's, even though the image is about something that's happening to a person, um, I put a lot of care into maybe showing their hand gripping the grass or the way the sand is, you know, piling up around a foot or these little things that like, to me, um, for, for me, they remind me of the kind of things I would stare at when I was a kid, like things like raindrops on a puddle or just plucking glass, grass lying in a lawn or watching the way sunlight came through the trees. Those are the kind of things that when you're not lost in thought are so obviously beautiful. And I, th I think putting them in there, I like to imagine that it's like sprinkling little things that are going to 
connect people to memories from their life. And I think that heightens the poignancy and the sense that this thing that's happening to the character is happening in a real world and space that is the same one you live in, doesn't it? Mm, mm, totally. Absolutely. Let's, let's shift gears here a little bit. Um, I, I've really enjoyed, you know, this this philosophical side to our our conversation. I, I've enjoyed it immensely. I, I'm dying to ask you though about some of the technical aspects behind what you do. But maybe we can we can start off with, again, just going back to your personal story. Did you study to gather these skills? How did you gain the technical abilities that you now possess? Hmm. Yeah, um, definitely, definitely helped by a school. Um, so my first five or six years was self-taught with the internet, which isn't really self-taught, you know, gathering resources online, reading books and watching videos and um, mostly forum posts. Um, and then when I was like 18, after about five years of drawing, I had gotten to a sort of decent novice intermediate level. Um, I made a lot of progress from when I was 13, but it was still in that sort of place of, you know, good for your age more than objectively good. It was exciting for a relative or a friend to see the progress, but if you just kind of put my work in front of a stranger, there wasn't going to be any reason for them to maybe connect with it. So I went and studied at um, a school called Sara. Swedish Academy of Real Estate, which is actually where I teach now. They used to be called Atelier Stockholm when they were in Stockholm, but we're down in the south of Sweden now. And um, I was on consumptart.org and saw, you know, I was coming up to the age where I was going to have to go to university and I had spent enough time and developed enough of like a work ethic with like making my own artwork that when I was looking at um, fine arts programs, I just felt like, I'm just going to be paying a lot of money to have someone tell me to draw. That's how I felt. Essentially. I, I, I know it sounds like arrogant, but I just didn't have any confidence in the ability of the teachers to really impart any of the technical knowledge of the kind that I wanted, you know, they can maybe teach you how to make prints. And I'm sure that, you know, there's a lot of knowledge in those schools, but the stuff that I was interested in doing, you know, drawing realistically, I just wasn't seeing it. You know, when I would click on a drawing program, like half the time the page would load up and I didn't see anything, didn't see any drawing there. And I would, you know, I would see like installation or something. And I felt very discouraged that the painting program didn't seem to have people painting. And then I saw my friend uh, posting online with, um, you know, realistic studies from, from life, from live models and plaster casts. And I was like, that's what I want to do. So I just searched for the school um, I, I sent in and got in and I was like, I guess I'm moving to Sweden now, uh, which I then had to figure out. And this is where the luck comes in. You know, it's like, because this is a school that, um, that wasn't in England and isn't a degree course, there was no option of getting a student loan. So tuition is around sort of 10,000 dollars ish us dollars a year which is sort of like simultaneously a lot of money obviously but also compared to a lot of tuition fees especially for us schools or from any other atelier or for studying if you want to study at a uk university and you're not a uk resident it's way you know it's a lot more than that so it's um my parents had seen that this wasn't a phase. This is something that I've been doing for years and putting a lot of effort in. And they both agreed that they would split because they were sort of splitting up around the time and selling the house. And so there was some money there and they were like, sort of, yeah, we can, um, you know, we can split your tuition in half for a year. And then at the end of the year, I, I was going so well that I, I really didn't want to leave and the school were willing to take some of the tuition off if I would do some work for them, like help with teaching the first year students. And, um, and I started freelancing to cover all my own living costs 
some of my parents just had to get tuition. So it's that thing where I can't, I can't own that. You know, it's like, uh, that's obviously, obviously one of those places where, uh, where I just am lucky in my life situation, but I do feel like it's always that mixture of, you never know who can help you out if they see you putting in the work first too. you know, if I hadn't spent five years doing this, my parents would have said, no, go to university. And, um, and the same with like, you know, I, I like to think it's because I really engaged in the school and showed up that they were willing to help figure out a way to make it more affordable to me. And, um, yeah. And I do want to stress as well that I know a lot of other amazing artists who are entirely self-taught outside of college. I think ateliers are an awesome thing to do, but they, it's kind of like studying. It's a really niche set of skills that doesn't fully encompass at all everything that you need to make it as an artist. It's like learning to play scales on a piano really well. I think music theory is the best analogy. I think any musician that is lucky or fortunate enough that they can find a way to learn some music theory is gonna benefit from it. But I bet there are phenomenal musicians who just have like their own, who just, you know, figured it out in other ways. It's kind of like, um, I think if it's accessible and if someone already has like developed a good work ethic, if you're already in Sweden, you can get it covered by student loan as well. And some countries now will cover for student loan. But um, I generally would recommend ateliers to most people. I mean, I teach there because I think it's an awesome place to be around. I think the students get a lot out of it. And um, for me, it definitely kickstarted um, pushing me away from wanting to do concept art and wanting to be a fine artist very much happened from the school. So I think, it, I think I probably would have, I like to think I would have ended up doing that eventually, but it kind of made me realize, uh, I had this weird idea in my head uh, cause I sort of discovered James Jean and saw that he had spent like 10 years in like illustration and then made the jump to fine art. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to do my 10 years in illustration and then when I'm a really established illustrator, I'm going to try and become a fine artist. And I remember just, you know, like the owner of the school being like, wait, but do you want to do illustration? No, well, don't, don't waste 10 years. It was, he was just, you know, he was just very much like, well, you don't have to look at anyone else's path and imagine there is no set path anyone has to go on. And, and bet between that and seeing a lot of, um, I've seen a lot of good art growing up in museums, but, um, it was kind of on a level where, you know, as a teenager, I would connect a lot more to someone whose drawing skills were closer to my own. So something can become so good that you just like, don't, it just becomes like alien. I didn't even understand or relate to it or have any context. And it was only really when I started like oil painting that, uh, and I think, I think classical music is a bit like this too. You get, I get the sense that every time I listen to classical music, I obviously find it beautiful, but I always just gravitate back towards, um, you know, contemporary stuff. And when I hear like real music theory nerds talking about like, you know, just how much like Beethoven or Mozart moves them, I, I have this kind of sense that I, I kind of lack the context to fully understand it. Does that make any sense? Like I, I just kind of don't connect emotionally yet. But uh, that's a really long rambly way of saying it's it's that kind of mixture of, um, yeah, I feel like it's important to really just own it, just like luck, you know, good fortune that my parents could afford to put me in school. Um, and then also really like that put a lot of onus on me that I was going to like, you know, I was pretty fired up for those years. Like I would be working long, long days and then, really got into going to the gym a lot to keep my sort of energy level up. And I just, I don't even, I look back already, like I'm only 26, but I look at how I was living when I was like 19 and it just seems so exhausting, you know, just from seven to midnight every day doing stuff. But um, I just want to make the emphasis to other people that if you don't have, if you're not in a life situation where that's ever feels realistically like it's going to be affordable, just don't, I don't, 
feel like you should freak out and that I know plenty of contemporary painters with just as much emphasis on realism who have reached that place um, entirely on their own. Like there's a painter called Christian Rex van Minen. He's a phenomenal oil painter. Just, he's like a magician with the stuff. And he really talks about going to the public library and taking out books on how old Flemish masters painted and actually reading them instead of just collecting them and internalizing it. And so, you know, I feel like there, there's always, there's a way. And uh, since that was available to me, I was going to try and take it. No, that I mean, I, that's one of the things that I get emailed about um, constantly is because people know that I went to an art school, um, if you can call it that. Um, and so they're they're asking me, hey, should I go to art school? Shall I shall I do this or shall I hit the books? Shall I do my own self directed learning? And I'm always in, in two minds about that. I, I just wish back then I had access to the to an atelier or some sort of school that taught the theory, taught me the, the music theory, if you will. So then I could go and then play my own notes um, based on the theory that I learned. What all I wanted early on was give me the tools, give yeah. me the, the tools no, to be brilliant. able to, to, to say, yeah, to say what I want to say. And then... I get to decide what I want to say. Well, what ended up happening when I went through the university system in Western Australia is we were indoctrinated. We were taught what to think and 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 not how to think, you know, what to say, not how to say it. And to me, I think that's where art today and the art world is failing because it is pushing too much a particular agenda and not putting the onus back on the individual to to express themselves the way they see fit. There's too much of a pushing of a particular ideal. And I just feel like telling these schools and these people, you back off. I'm a, I'm a person with valid ideas and opinions, and I get to say what I want to say. And people will either like it or they won't. But regardless, whenever I drop a painting, whenever I say something on canvas, there will be people there who will appreciate it. Some people won't, but that's okay. You know? I, I think that's fun. I feel very fortunate to have, because while I went to an art school, in a way, it's um, when you go to an atelier or when you went to our atelier, um, I mean, like 99% of the time you spend drawing or painting and the people who run it, Hans and Son are very, um, very much interested. You know, they have their own opinions about art and what is meaningful for them in art. But at the same time, they really don't try to, like when we do the creative exercises and stuff, there's no sense of telling people you can't, you know, you can just, you could submit abstract art over and over again if you wanted. And then um, there's no sense of like, we all have to paint the same or do it or express ourselves in the same way. And I, I'm really grateful for that as well. Um, and I'm kind of grateful to have not received an education in art history because I think that's something that I'm going back and discovering the people that I like now. I could see one argument that you worry, it makes you contextless and you're not going to, but I feel like all of this, like worrying about what's already been said, what movements have been done, I think that kind of stuff is really like poisonous to your own personal, um, you know, if I'd gone through art school and had just been told like surrealism was a movement that happened in the past and it wasn't particularly interesting anymore, I might have just like, that could have really discouraged me. And I feel quite grateful that, uh, that um, in some sense, like my values for making art was set in the world of illustration and concept art. And I feel like the programming I had to let go of to create stuff in the way I wanted to was the values of that community. And I just knew nothing about fine art. I, I, I had to let go of the idea that the ideal for an artist is someone who can draw absolutely anything and get passionate and find what's interesting in it. Cause that's what you have to, if you're a concept artist, really what makes a great concept artist, in my opinion, is someone who can uh, see the, you, you know, you're almost like that hired gun for being able to, get into anyone else's idea and world and world building and um, being incredibly broad in your ability to create stuff, you know? And so for me, it was always a sense of, I have to be able to do landscapes, people, vehicles, industrial design, draw spaceships. And then, you know, like 
getting into fine art for me was realizing like I can just draw whatever I want. And I, I guess that's where you want everyone to end up at, hopefully. But I do, I do think, yeah, I do. Some, some ways I feel optimistic about today as a time for making art because I feel like um, in the small, tiny experience I've had with galleries in the grand scheme of things, there has been this kind of openness. I've, I felt like, uh, so I mean, like I, I learned to draw and um, was sort of training, tra- training. I suppose the community that I, yeah, that I was a part of when I was learning to draw was the illustration concept art community and the aspirations and the values imposed on you there were about, um, you know, for example, in concept art, it helps to really be able to be very broad in your subject matter and to almost be the kind of ultimate, you know, hired gun for design and world building. You know, you need to be able to find any different subject matter and find what's interesting in it and uh, figure out how it works and how to implement it into the project you're working on. Um, Though maybe, you know, I shouldn't talk, I I have had more experience now with concept artists to say the opposite, that it's okay to specialize. But um, the ultimate point I was trying to make is that I, I kind of didn't come from anywhere where I was being taught art history or being taught about different movements. And I kind of worry that I could have found that kind of education a little bit discouraging if I, if I had learned that surrealism uh, or realism in general was sort of art movements that happened in the past and that weren't viewed as interesting anymore, then I fear that could have discouraged me from following them, which would, um, which kind of, you know, which would have sucked if you ask me, because that's like where I've really found my own voice and my own, like where I like to express myself. And I, I do think from the modest experience I've had with galleries that um, I found like quite a big openness um, and from an audience as well it, people just want to find artwork that they can connect to and that's a big thing that drives me yeah is trying to trying to make artwork that I just find interesting without having to convince myself it's interesting that's kind of the point I was yeah, getting to earlier which is that um and that's to me what what realism is you said earlier i love that you said it's like the the pretty picture thing is the hooks like a lot of my favorite um musicians or artwork in general so i'm there are like people who love stuff that is so on the fringes of being understandable and uh interpretable that there's a kind of alien quality to it and i love that stuff too in small doses i love finding that weird experimental musician who's pushing the limits of what music means and i love finding that kind of art house movie that's four hours long and is really beautiful but you can't follow the plot and it's giving you a headache um i love that stuff too and i can appreciate the kind of intense hypnotic Uh, quality that popular music and popular films have there's something fascinating about the candy like surface to mass media that it's just like so engineered to hook attention but then it's like candy there's no sustenance it's just kind of like um a quick rush and then it's gone as quickly as it came in possibly leaving you where, where And the artwork that I've always been interested in making and that is my favorite is that kind of synthesis of the two. It's understanding enough the art form of, like I said, I think of attention as the whole medium. So I, so understanding how to play with attention, how to make something that is easy or preferable to pay attention to, but then to give it that subversive, interesting lasting edge and that that's the space that i'm always like looking for is like yeah how to make something that simultaneously reads very quickly you'll notice a lot of my compositions very dense they're not sort of big sprawling things but that stick in your head stick in your head for days that's kind of the goal i suppose that that was a criticism that was um thrown my way in university, I mean, I, again, I, I didn't consider myself and don't now consider myself to be a very deep person, but that was one thing that they were they were throwing my way was 
Andrew, your your works are too obvious. It's too obvious the meaning. And to me, that always kind of ruffled my feathers a little bit because I thought, well, I take that as a compliment because I, I knew what how they were intending it, but I said, I'm going to take that as a compliment because obvious to me is just another word for communicates well. And uh, when I when I look at your work, you know what? Uh, they're, they're layered with meaning. There's a lot of deep meaning in there. And I guess the viewer brings to it whatever they do and, and are able to derive whatever meaning they're capable of. But uh, for me, it, they're also obvious. It, it just smacks me immediately. It's an immediate um, an immediate reaction. And, and it's a reaction on a level that I, I'm not accustomed to with, with many other artists. You know, I, I, I love surrealism. You know, and I, I got this with some of Dali's work um, and another Australian artist by the name of James Gleason. Um, could you talk to us a little bit more about some of the artists that you admire from the past or maybe present of the people that really influenced you? Maybe that moment of recognition when you saw what they were doing, it's like, oh, oh, well, that's novel. That's different. That's That's got some okay. legs. That's a great question. And they, yeah, they are moments. Um, an obvious one, but obvious maybe is a great place to start, is um, uh, Alphonse Mucha. He's a Czech painter, artist. Um, I believe he's Czech. God, I hope I'm right. I'm fairly sure he's Czech. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yes, his museum's in Prague, and, and of course, oh. the Slava was in Prague. I think if I had to give you, you know, a candidate for something as ridiculous when it comes to the arts as a goat, a greatest of all time, sure, there's something so thrilling about the technical brilliance of the way he draws. It is just so infused with like mastery and nothing nothing is ever just drawn okay there's this kind of um every single subject is always portrayed with a poetic excellence there's always this sense of it's never just some cloth it's this cloth and it's dancing and flowing with the composition and the curve and position of the pose and the eye contact it's so theatrical and beautiful it just i find it thrilling and most inspiring to me is that he had this you know runaway com his commercial self is the least interesting period of his life in my opinion like he did all these lithographs and advertising illustration and had this fantastic career doing that but the last 20 years of his life he um really dedicated to making this series of paintings called the Slav Epic, which is sort of 20 um, monumental scale paintings. They're mostly like 10 by eight meters that tell the kind of mythological and literal history of the Slavic people. And um, they're just like, I remember seeing them for the first time and truly being sort of like floored at the, how deep the rabbit hole goes on painting, you know, it's like, I'm in that stage where if I can like kind of craft like a little head and make it look real, you know, make it look half real. I'm feeling good about myself for the day. And then you're going in and seeing these paintings that are like, just this kind of river of just, I don't know if you, have you ever seen them pictures of them? I, I, I'm familiar with the work you're talking about. Yeah. Al Alphonse Merca. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I think the ones that I'm more familiar with are are his commercial works that you're talking about. I I, I will have to look up the Slav epic paintings. That sounds incredibly intriguing. So often he would in the picture plane he would have um, a scene at the bottom, and you have to imagine this thing is like something like eight meters across. So you're walking in front of it. So this is this is the first in the I believe you just search for the Slav epic. This is the first in the series of paint. No, it's not the first. The first is the it's within the first three. But there's um there's kind of a scene at the bottom that is like a festival scene, and uh, and then there's this kind of 
he'll do the mythological plane with this kind of blue haze around it floating in the foreground. And uh, when you stand in front of this thing, you can walk up to every group of people and there's, um, and it's painted so much better than you can capture on the screen here. And it's kind of like wearing VR goggles because no matter how close or far away you are, this thing is encompassing your whole vision. Like there's a scale of painting where it becomes, uh, yeah, like a sort of primitive VR. And, you, and you, your experience of looking at this painting is at one minute you're standing really close and you're making eye contact with this woman in the foreground with her baby. And then you can kind of step back and like a ghost, you're drifting out and seeing her in context of the whole scene and so anyway, see, seeing 20 of these paintings was like a little art pilgrimage. And it really sort of, that was like a big moment for me. Um, because it just really set the goalposts of like, don't get caught up in, like there's always so much so much further you can go with it. There's there's always and, another rung on that ladder, isn't there? And, and yeah, works, another, like that, works like that really reminds you of, of what's possible. Yeah. And I really wish, you, I mean, you should just, I would recommend anyone who, uh, I think it's back in Prague. It was for a while out in Japan and China, but I think it's back in Prague now. And especially if you live in Europe and flights aren't super expensive and Prague's not an expensive place, it's like 100% worth going to Prague just to see the paintings um, when they're on display. And then, so he was a big influence on me and he's got so many beautiful drawings and sketches i think the first time i saw james jean's work was very influential um not i mean i i love james jean's work um i really do love his work um for whatever reason i think just seeing him contemporary and like the kind of career he was having and and the sort of like freedom in the sketching and it, it really like um stuck with me it was very inspirational as i think it was for many uh many people contemporary today. And then um, I really love, um, I mean, there were so many people I used to idolize on the forums. Mm. The great, I, Beksinski is another painter. Zdzislaw Beksinski? Yeah. yeah. He's another painter that really struck me of, of like painting being a window into a space, you know, into the imagination itself. Like his paintings have this thing about them where, you know, it's like you've got a little window into some nightmarish corner of the multiverse. And yeah, it's not a not a place I want to go, man. But I mean, no, not, in terms of in terms of looking at his paintings, um, yeah, it's. I, I didn't mean not want to go on this podcast. We should talk about him because. Again, he's another one of these people. It's like it's almost like a Geiger. You can't unsee that. Yeah, and, and it's, um, so, it's so self, um, it's so coherent with itself. Yeah, yeah. When when you see that kind of work, it's like it's obviously not um, anything you're seeing expressed around you, you know, on this earth. But there's something about it that's so coherent and makes so much sense visually that it gives you this feeling that it's, it doesn't feel quite right for me to say that he, he made it up. Does that make sense? Of course. Of course. It's I, like it's archetypically I, true or something. There's a feeling when I look at, um, Bixinski's work that I, I, yeah, again, there's a moment of recognition. It's almost like, oh yeah, I've reached that. Cause I, I feel that, that, interfacing with art on an honest level when you have that that visceral reaction to it it's just you're simply remembering what's already within you and um that's i i think that's why i find it disturbing i think if that aspect wasn't within myself i wouldn't have an emotional reaction to it and again it's it's a bit like when i look at your work not that you're anywhere near as dark as as Bixinski. um I just, I, I just, again, it, 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 it hits a note. It pushes that button. Um, uh, so that's fantastic. So these are, the, I can hear that you've been influenced, but you're, you're also thinking about crafting and shaping your own voice and your own direction, borrowing what you can from your artistic heroes, if you will, but then carrying forward. I want to ask you a little bit more about 
maybe maybe we can get into the the nuts and bolts of your art business because if, if there's one thing that I get asked about a lot and the question I like to pass off to my guests, it, it's all to do with. Hey Andrew, how do I make it as an artist? Where do I get started? Um, you know, how do I go about selling my work? So here you are. You're you're 26 years old. You're a full time artist, which is phenomenal. Um, and and again, I don't say that to patronize. I mean, your work is exceptional. It's no wonder. Um, but can you give us a snapshot as to how your business works and, and in as much detail as you feel comfortable with sharing as to how do you make it as an artist? So being barely not a stupid child, um, I feel like every year is a process of turning it into more and more of what feels like a legitimate business that could last. There's been, a, there's been a sense that the path for me was not to have any kind of plan, but it was to focus so much on the core. The core business of being an artist is the artwork, right? And um, there's, always, there's always felt like a sense to me that you can, you can know everything. You can do everything perfectly, but if you don't have the artwork, there's no... Um, there's no, there's no business there. There's no fuel for it. Sure, and so sure. for a long time for me, if, especially, um, you know, coming, coming out of studying, I didn't have student debt, but I also had sort of exactly no money. I felt like I was, uh, as and actually at that age, it's very lucky to be on zero. Like that's, <laughs> that's an advantageous position, but I just felt like, um, uh, I didn't know where to start with business. Um, I, you know, I was in a place where just from like, I, I honestly believe that if you're like making work that is appropriate for companies to hire you, you're going to hear from them, you know, like that, like a certain, after a certain level of skill and the more skill you develop, the rarer that becomes. Um, and especially if you do something very specific. So um, I could get some jobs, but the reality of a lot of small time illustration, if you're living in like a Western country, if you're living in like England or like in Sweden, like it is incredibly hard to make a living and like, say support a family just doing like only fantasy illustration, which is what I used to do because so many of the rates feel like they haven't been updated in 20 years. And so if you're, if you're doing even if you get good commission rates, you know, you're not going to have a constant stream of commissions. So for a long time, my business used to be that I, I would go like exactly broke at the end of every month. And then I would just be like, okay, I'm going to scramble to like try just a million different things from making little gum road tutorials that I would sell for $5 to doing any illustration I could find on and, and just doing as much as I had to do to, you know, make my bills at the end of the month. But, um, Nowadays, it's starting to feel more um, secure, but I didn't get there by, it, it's kind of like, I felt like I've focused on the artwork for so long that people were just like asking to find a way to pay me for it. Instead of being like, here, I have some prints, why will no one buy them? I just kept having people saying like, do you sell prints? Do you? Like the, after a certain point, people start like with galleries. Like I have, when people ask me, how did you get into galleries? My answer is so unsatisfying to them. Cause it's just like, I've tried approaching gal. I've tried going into galleries with a sketchbook. I tried none of that. I'd send emails. None of that stuff works. Same with magazines. And then after a certain amount of time of building up my own platform online, essentially galleries and magazines and stuff would just like come to you. And the weird thing about having a big Instagram is people presume you know what you're doing when you can be like broke and barely feeling like a functioning adult galleries would just be like, so, you know, what do you, do you want to work with us now? And it's like, um, okay. Yeah. Massive imposter syndrome for a couple of years. But nowadays I would say, um, so I most, the most, the best value for money and time income is selling prints. Um, and I, I've never, 
it's quite a, if you want to do that fully independently, if you want to produce them, if you want to fulfill them, you know, ship them to people, um, and all of that stuff, that's like quite a lot of work. That's a lot of different hats to wear. So over time, what I've done is just when various like fine art studios who can make high quality prints and can fulfill them and all of that stuff, I tend to just work with them and split, um, split profits 50, 50 in the future. I think as it continues to scale, um, that 50, 50 ratio becomes less and less in your favor. Like in the beginning, uh, if someone is spending a lot of time to, um, you know, it's a lot of man hours going to packing all the prints, sending them, doing the customer service. But if you look at someone like James Jean, who sells editions of a few thousand of prints for $200, I mean, you're looking at like a gross, gross sale of a few hundred thousand dollars on every print sale he does. And, um, eventually, um, the labor involved kind of isn't scaling to like half of that cut. So I imagine, I mean, if, if you were making that kind of money, you could just fire, you could hire a few people to work for you full time, which I think is, I feel like I've heard rumors that he just has a, some staff and, you know, you have, you have, I think the thing to remember as an artist is like the thing that you are uniquely good at doing is making artwork. Like I am terrible at bookkeeping and accounting. I do it the best I can, but as soon as I could make enough money to hire an accountant, I do that. And that's kind of been the big philosophy for me is just like the more things I can um, responsibly and reasonably outsource, um, I'm willing to give someone half of the paycheck for, for producing some pins and selling them just to not, like it's weeks of your time and yeah. I'm finding more and more that like, even in this, even in like now you're expected, essentially replying on Instagram, you're being your own customer service person, you're being your own salesman, you're emailing people. Like when I sell stickers, me and my girlfriend do that together. And it, it's so much work doing all of this stuff. And it can, it can begin to feel like between that and life and you need to see the dentist and you need to cook food. And you, it's so easy for things to slowly eat at your creative time. So right now, the thing that I really am like trying to viciously guard is like time in the studio just to sketch and just to make new stuff because that's how I got to this position is through making artwork. So yeah, I guess like my income is pretty much split between sales of originals, sales of prints, and then, um, a smaller chunk again comes from teaching and then lots of, sm and then putting my, just trying as many different things as possible. There's a little bit that comes in from tutorials. There's a little bit that comes in from stickers, a little bit that comes in from pins. Maybe I'm trying a sculpture because what's, what will stick for you. I tried a Patreon. It didn't really work very well with my pace, how long it makes, takes me to make art, you know, but I think if you're trying to, once you've put the time in and got your skills going, you, you just have to try everything and you have to, um, you have to kind of cultivate a part of yourself that can enjoy putting in. Like it's a lot of work, you know, you, you can't expect this to just like happen, unfortunately. For sure. I, I, <laughs> I heard something recently in an audiobook. I, I like listening to audiobooks while I, while I paint. And, um, this one was called, uh, was it Millionaire Success Habits? Cheesy title, I know, by <laughs> Dean Grazi Graziosi. I, I, I like, but I, you know, I, I like, I like business books, you know, and I like motivational things, and I like things that are success oriented. Uh, you never, you never know where that that next gem of wisdom is going to come from. But he was talking about this very problem where you need to identify those tasks that are within your business that take you away from your core set of skills. And it was really interesting where we, we're brought up to to feel like if there is a weakness, if there is something that we struggle with, then we need to actually drill down, focus on that area and make that a strength. And he's saying, uh-uh, that, that's, that's not the way you should do it at all. What you should actually do is focus on what you do best, focus on your strength and go through a, a process of eliminate, replace, delegate, automate, do all of these things to get out of those those areas within your art business that are that are taxing and and focus on what you do best and 
I'm, I'm very fortunate the position that I'm in um, where I get to work with my wife and my wife works for our, our art business full time and she's on customer service, which takes an extraordinary amount of time. She helps me sometimes behind the camera. Uh, she'll, she'll be operating the camera. She'll sometimes help me with the video editing, but it is a full time job more than for, for both of us. And I, I would shudder to think wh where I would be if I didn't have her help. And there might be a, a point in the near future where I'll have to take on more of a team, more staff. Uh, and I'm considering that very closely as the business begins to develop and grow. But it's interesting, you know, hearing what you say, you do have to um, safeguard ferociously sometimes your your inner sanctum, your studio space, your your space to create because otherwise the business minutia can totally overrun and and the mental space as well so now by the time you're done your admin you're shot you know yeah exactly that's the thing for me is I, I actually feel like i have like four optimistically four good hours in a day of concentration like i'll do more hours of work than that but if i'm talking like when i can feel that i am undistracted long periods of focus, peak concentration. It is just such a days are painfully short for that reason alone. There's a lot of hours in the day, but there are just not, there is no, there is not, especially I feel like, um, yeah, I don't know. I've felt this change in myself as I've gotten even a couple of years older than I used to be. Like even five years ago, I felt like it was a little bit longer. And I imagine in some ways, I actually feel like I've gotten better at managing my time now because I appreciate. But that, that thing you said about like yeah, like guarding your time, like if you, especially if you're a young and teenage artist, like I mean, like literally, like I almost had to get into arguments with friends, like no, I'm not coming out tonight. Like I'm just gonna work on some drawings. Oh my god! No, like, I'm, I'm not yeah. impressed. Yeah. I'm not sad. No, I just I really like people will not necessarily understand in the beginning how seriously you take this, but those small moments with the boundaries you're setting with your friends and family around you, if they can see that, um, and if you can see more importantly, that your commitments to yourself and your practice are easily dropped away, you lose that sense of respect for them. So let's say if I was like, I'm, I'm going to do two hours of drawing every day this week. Like if you're new to art, set yourself the challenge that you're going to do an hour of drawing every day this week. And like, there is an hour every day for you to draw if you cut out anything else and the thing is just setting that that internal skill of like there's going to come a moment where you don't want to do it for whatever reason or there's something else you could do instead and learning that when you tell yourself you're going to do something that you can rely on yourself to do it is such a way of building actual self-confidence and like self-respect and self-esteem because i think like i actually feel like it carried me in some senses, like learning the skills of how to get good at art, like helped me with a lot of, um, helped me to have a lot of self-esteem and a lot of other situations in my life, because there were so many situations where I felt like I didn't need approval from someone else or even from a relationship, because I felt like I had this relationship with myself that made me feel good about myself. Like, I honestly feel so fortunate that I had role models who encouraged me online to learn to love practicing and improving at something because I actually feel like it's just like the best general life advice you can receive. Do you get what I mean? Like, like to, you know, if you're having, if you're in like a relationship with someone else, like a romantic relationship and deep down, you're kind of not that fond of yourself and you're, you're needing this other person to validate you. Um, that's just way too much to put on someone else. And so I, I think in like almost every, every area of your life, if you have that kind of, self-confidence that comes from I wanted to do something really hard and I was able to find a way to to do it that that's like you know and I don't mean like the broader career goals but I just yeah starting with something really small like um every day this week I'm going to draw for an hour or draw for half an hour so I I like to constantly do things that are difficult for that reason as well you know the the uh, I will say the I, I agree 100%. Um, the 
thing that has helped me enormously is finding some sort of schedule or routine and having a very formulaic approach to the day um, and also winning the day from the outset. So I, I set a rigorous schedule. I'm up at 4 a.m. Uh, during the week mornings. And a lot of people, when they hear that, they're like, first, yeah, right. But bakers do it. There's a lot of people out there that wake up at that sort of hour. Th those kind of hours no one's bothering you. The phone's not ringing. You know, yeah, I might get a few emails. I don't check that. I don't check my phone. I go straight down to the studio and and I get a cup of decaf coffee. I have my green smoothie right there and I'm working. And, and I found that through winning the day by getting up at an earlier uh, time, it, it builds this momentum. And now I, I kind of get on this roll. And once I build that rhythm into it, it's easier for those hours to just kind of go. And, and they're good hours. So for me, typically in a day, I'll, I'll get anywhere between eight to 12 great hours of solid production in without actually having my attention span waning. The other thing that's helped me, though, has been diet and also cutting out every addictive substance that I had going. So I completely cut out the alcohol. And again, no judgment on you, Miles, at all. Um, but also co completely cut out the the caffeinated beverages. Um, I found before... That's what you should be judging me. That's the caffeine abuse. Yeah. So what you mentioned before we had on the call, you're like, I better not have a coffee because if I have another coffee, I'm going to have a stroke. I'm like, oh, bro, like, I, <laughs> I know what that's like. I know what that's like. I would shake if I didn't have enough, you know, but it, it's been interesting. I thought I would die. I thought my work would take a dive by by changing everything in my life so drastically, but you know, it's had the opposite effect, um, which I'm really surprised about. The other thing though, and, and you mentioned this earlier in our conversation, the thing that's helped me so much has been physical exercise. Um, of actually having regular gym time scheduled during the day, every day, and and having some sort of physical regimen that that I show up and I do something physical, move my body, reconnect with my body, and then I find that that carries on into the next day. And amazing, it, inspiring to be honest. Yeah, a lot of a um, lot of things I wonder if I rationalized or let slip. You know, I mean, I've thought so many times about wanting to. Uh, pull back from caffeine but it, it it feels impossible I never feel I feel like when I feel like I'm never going to have the time to go through two weeks of having a shitty headache every day and it's like I, I constantly it's constantly in my head it's like oh I could do this next time I take some time off and then the time off is here and I'm hanging out with friends and I'm like well I don't want to be just like not focused and in that conversation so I feel like I'm on this constant um I mean, like truly like an addictive thing. Like I find it hard, like you said, I find it hard to visualize life without coffee. Yeah, I, I do too. It's so bad for me still. I mean, I feel like I'm still an addict, but if I see it in a movie or a TV show, I'll be like, and they'll be at a diner and the waitress will come by with the big pot of hot coffee, that bottomless cup of coffee, you know, and they'll just... They'll just pour it in the cup and I'll be looking at two mobsters sitting at a booth in a diner on a TV show. I'll be like, oh, that coffee looks good. It's 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 that deep physical crutch, that that hook. It's got you and and it, it wants to be fed. Um, and I, got a, I got a whole drawing I'm making about addiction right now because I think about it a lot. I think from a sort of from a Buddhist, from everything from the um from the minutiae of the things we get addicted to, but more the sort of structure of um, the structure of an addiction psychologically. And, and then I, I sort of almost like the kind of Buddhist, you know, from there is a perspective in which we are sort of, um, there's no, you know, we're addicted to uh life and sensation itself in some you know it's this kind of this structure psychologically of an addiction to me i heard um someone called uh he's like dr gabon mate or something he's what he's one of these people who works with um has worked with addiction and a lot of people and he, he was talking about the 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 cycle of craving and um fulfillment of you know the habit and then the, the sort of impermanence of any 
um, fulfillment of the craving and the reappearance. After a while, he was saying the thing that someone partaking in a habit is trying to do is that there's an actual, there's an actual kind of suffering in craving something. There is a disturbance of your inner peace. You know, your it is dom- your ability to be present is being dominated by this reappearing thought or reappearing desire and intention. Wow. Yeah. And in the moment of fulfilling an addiction, the reason it's so satisfying is that for the moments it's being fulfilled, you are actually free from the desire until it cuts back in again. So what is so satisfying about um, giving in on a habit is that for a few seconds, you are actually free from the craving of desire. Like it's the really, the temporarily release from the, so, you know, what an addict most wants is to be free from their own addiction. Like how interesting. And, and so yeah. that, that kind of that down, downward spiral of, um, but whether, you know, obviously there are these kind of um, obviously destructive relationships we can have, you know, there are molecules, there are substances that can really hijack your reward system. But then we talked about phone addiction. We've talked about, I think in some sense, climate change and, environmental degradation and our economic conception of how we structure societies is all fueled by addictive patterns to maybe to comfort or to a sense to separate ourselves from the more brutal and raw face of nature you know the parasites in your eyeballs and hunger in your stomach face of nature not just sort of the beautiful trees but there's that kind of that we we don't understand how to like a kind of addict in a downward spiral and like me with my coffee, we can't conceive of, um, no one under, you know, we have no vision for another way of being in the world. And so I I think to me, addiction is such an interesting topic because it links together personal issues that most people are having with a sort of collective, a, a sort of collective issue we're all going through together. So it's this interesting way of analyzing how the, how, any, how your individual experience of the world relates to our sort of collective problems, the way we form our societies. It, to me, addiction is a really good way of analyzing and looking at both of those things. And so I, and I want to make a drawing about it, but I, it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> Where I kind of have one in progress that sort of, I can tell myself a story that makes it about addiction. But, you know, sometimes these ideas are just interesting to me. I feel, you know, that would be my advice as well. When people ask, how do you get inspired? It's like, um, you have to just figure out, just follow what you find interesting on any level. There's no boundaries between different, uh, borders of knowledge and inquiry, you know, on some, on some level, uh, I don't see any separation between there's just inquiry into the nature of reality and different levels of analysis and, Ultimately, whatever you're going to find inspiring is going to come from it. Some people might be driven more by um, a very intuitive feeling based, um, you know, that you might hear us talking and just say, blah, 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 blah. Like I just am blown away by the beauty of light playing upon nature or uh, moments of, yeah, stuff that you can't put into words and that putting into words feels like you're sort of destroying it. But it's just, you just have to follow what you find interesting. Exactly. Um, wow, that's, that's amazing. Again, so much there to unpack. I, I, I just want to, just something that popped into my head then it were a couple of things in talking about the, the addiction. Um, I read in, in Napoleon Hill, Hill's book. No, actually it was Napoleon Hill's audio series that was again about uh, success and mindset and he was speaking this is one of those rare recordings that's i pretty sure it's still available online um where he was addressing the, the audience and he was talking about addiction and also intemperance you know inability to control those those urges that you have you know be it a physical addiction to a substance a sexual addiction um, or, or anything, anything that drags you away from you. Um, he said there will be a certain point where he'll be at a, at a cocktail party and he might have a cocktail, but there is a certain point where the cocktails start drinking him. And I found that so, so fascinating where it's like, 
Uh, yeah, there's a point where it doesn't actually, it, it's no longer something that's serving you. And I, I do take your point as well. And I like that idea that by satiating these things, it is freeing you in that moment from the thing that is, is tormenting you. This is my own personal journey and my struggle with myself, getting control of myself. Um, not many, I, I keep my personal life and my family life pretty private. I have watched members of my own direct family destroy their lives with substances. And it's been an incredibly painful experience watching your family torn apart by one individual who cannot control themselves. And my heart goes out to anybody who, is, who has lived in a family with somebody with mental illness or a, a particular addictive personality where they literally destroy their lives with drugs or alcohol. And, and my heart especially goes out to anyone who struggles yeah. with those things personally, because I sometimes feel, I feel so much of that, the fundamental discomfort that can drive which, which to me is the primary source of any addiction is uh, why, why are we, the real question is why are we not able to be here now and be comfortable? What is it that is stopping you from, like anyone out there right now who's just take a second to pause from the narrative of I've got to get better at art, I've got to earn a bit, like just, t I really want you to take a second and like just tell yourself like where you are right now is completely perfect like that's the that's the truly subversive thought to have in in our day you know the the almost the real forbidden thought is like what if it is just perfect as it is right now i don't mean perfect in that it's lacking any suffering or that there aren't you know i'm, I'm not saying that but i mean in that it's just totally complete like there's always something about the present moment that is in some sense Com completed not lacking in anything and to me the question that i'm driven yeah driven by is it doesn't you know obviously there are like kinds of experiences i really don't want to have and but i i found no matter how much i fulfill the kinds of experiences i think i do want to have it you are never fully satiated and that's why that's where it becomes very interesting to me to analyze addiction because i think it really relates to everybody's experience in the world of not really knowing exactly what we're meant to be doing here with our lives because okay so there are there are cases where, where it becomes very obvious like you said where someone can be destroying their lives with uh, a substance or their behavior or, but in some sense like um Every, you know, we're, I feel like we're constantly stuck in a cycle of reacting to sensations and feelings within the body. And, uh, you know, this is what gets interesting to me is like what um, I'm trying to get my thoughts in order here so that I'm not just rambling because it's nearly 11 and I'm, my brain is tired. <laughs> well, but, it's uh, late there. It's, it's really late there. I, and I appreciate your time so much. Uh, can I? No, no, this just, is, this is fine. go on, you go. I can do, tell do, I interrupted you. No, no. Well, no, I, I, I just want to, I just want to touch, touch back on, on that. And, and again, I appreciate what you're saying, because I think it is important to have compassion for the person who is going through um, a, a certain kind of addiction. I've gotten to the point now in my life where I've stopped blaming those people, but now I've started looking at it like this is a, again, a way of escaping the present moment because I think the nature of existence is for most people, incredibly scary, dark, and painful. And there are a lot of challenges that people face. And here we are, I, I'm trying to have a podcast which gives people real strategies for success and trying to make it in their art. And and maybe in a way, maybe in a way, this, this is a distraction for a lot of us to just kind of get out of the present moment. But how much of what we do in our in our lives robs us of that, that opportunity? Um, and again, I, I think this is also where I get my drive from because I've seen people in my life screw up so bad that there's no coming back. And it makes me feel ridiculously lucky and grateful for the opportunity that I've been given and I can't waste the moment. Um, but at the same time, again, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to take the bottle of wine out of their hand or the joint away from them. Uh, I, I, it's almost like it's it, look, if you need to do that, 
I get, I get that it's hard for you. I'm, I'm not judging. I'm not judging. It's a weird position to be in. There are obviously there are experiences that feel a little bit like uh, borrowing joy from you know from tomorrow. You going on a cocaine bender, <laughs> spending the weekend doing coke. That's stealing. You know that that's just taking all of the. That's wanting the pleasure now. I'll pay the bill later. You know, it's like taking a little short loan. There are kinds of experiences that can be sort of archetypically self-destructive in that they're, I just want to feel good right now and I'll, and future me will pay the consequences. And that's one pattern. But where it gets interesting to me is in some sense, there are these other experiences, right? So like going for a good run, exercising, waking up early where we're, you know, I'm, I'm going to pay as you go. I'm going to, I'm going to pay the bill. I'm going to sort of suffer right now in the moment, but it carries with it this kind of smoother, more consistent, feel good. Yeah. But the interesting thing to me, and that really troubles me sometimes, is that are these not just different styles of getting high? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Sure. Like, in, like You're trading sure, one for one, another. One quite clearly might be healthier on the body. You might live a little bit longer. Your health span might be increased. You might not destroy your relationships in the same way. But but neither escapes. Um, you know, no one gets out of this thing alive. No one. There's there's this element to me that sometimes feels like when I'm when I'm getting up early and I'm exercising and I'm eating the right food and I, I love doing all of this stuff. I sometimes feel like I've just found a different way of playing this game, which is that. I'm so desperate to form an identity and self-esteem because part of me is so afraid to just, to just be present right now. And that, and, and it's hard to even explain what I mean by that. If you don't already know what I mean by that, but there's something, um, there's something, sometimes I just feel like, uh, what, what, what the hell is it that I'm sort of running from? And, but then of course there are the realities of, uh, you know, we're all here trying to fight entropy together. We can't all just kind of sit down and do nothing. Like society is run on this constant, you know, this constant rebuilding of the machinery that keeps us alive. And um, so I think there are like obvious reasons why maybe it's like, you know, better to try to make healthy productive choices but at the same time i have i have a lot of sympathy especially artistically for what like drives people to just want to like intensely feel and experience while they're here and while they're alive and and that's i feel especially um connected and sympathetic to people with problems with addiction because i so strongly feel that i feel like it's the same discomfort that drives me to be an artist and to make artwork and you know in the end i'm just trying to feel okay with myself yeah yeah and again about being being in the present moment or being dragged out of the present moment through various things i find that the creating artwork is the best way for me to access the present uh, i spend too much of my time um in my body feeling the addictions um i need sugar i need salt i need whatever or I, uh, I, I need to, you're going deep if you're cutting out soul. That's, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and, and then, you know, but when I, when I, I find when I'm really in the zone and really painting, that's when the voice inside quietens down. And now suddenly I'm, I'm reconnected. I, I desperately crave that time. Can I, can I propose an alternative to the way you worded that? Cause this is something that Please, I say, yeah, a lot absolutely. As well, which is when we say, to be in the moment part of me every single time i hear that wants to say like where else could you be you've never ever not been in the moment i want to say it's sort of like for me it's actually more about the quality of attention and kinds of experiences because obviously even to be fully lost in thought to be just you know to be in the most beautiful place of your life but you know to be out in nature but to be worrying about your taxes or your bills or something um, you're not not in the moment. You're just in a shitty moment. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Sure like there's, a, there's, a, there's a quality to the moment that could be better. So part of me feels like it actually is a relief to me to realize like 
if you're trying to get out of your head, if you're trying to escape, there is some relief in just saying there's no escape. Like you, and I don't mean that in a heavy way, but, but just sometimes it's better to surrender. Like there is nowhere to escape to. Um, so the question for me becomes about how do we, what kinds of experiences do we want to have and how do we like, yeah, how do I, how do I feel more peaceful? And like you said, yeah, like concentrating on doing artwork, the thing that keeps me coming back to that too, is just that to be that focused on something and nonverbal as you paint, you know, to be seeing how you want to sculpt the form and the light and just hearing, feeling the brush, hearing the material, it's like the good news to me, like I sound like a heavy person, but the good news to me is like anytime you can actually get out of your head and silence all of this chattering, um, it's almost, there's something inherently beautiful and powerful about life. And that's, that's what keeps me alive and optimistic is actually that I, I have this continual process of that the suffering is actually just me being distracted. It's me being unable to connect with what's happening right now, which is almost always something that is, that carries a kind of inherent well-being if you can pay attention to it in the right kind of way. Yeah. Miles, do you, do you meditate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, so I went through, I got into a kick of it last year where I was doing 20 minutes a day and then it's kind of um, slipped, slipped out of the habit over the past couple of months. So I would like to start again. It's one of those things that it's like jogging or eating health, anything it's hard to make yourself do it. And every time you do it, you ask yourself, why don't I do this all the time? It's just this weird quality that the things that will actually make you feel better carry none of the sexiness of the things that will make you feel good literally right now. But, you know, it slips out of your hands. I'd recommend it to anyone, but I understand why it's so hard to get going. I, and I couldn't describe it to someone else. I'd had people tell me over and over again, to meditate and then for some reason one day it was like well i've tried everything else <laughs> so yeah. i'll try this and then i and i discovered i uh, especially in today's information overload if it actually feels so good sometimes to be like oh, i can just i can do nothing for 20 minutes except follow my breath or just notice what's happening it's uh, actually it can be a real joy sometimes yes yeah no, oh, that's that's wonderful. I found that it's it has, and again, a, a bit like you, I I had a practice a while ago um, where I would meditate every day, and only for ten minutes, but it was enough for me to feel that sense of of connection to, well, to 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 me, but also just being again in the moment. I I and I know I know exactly what you were saying about having a different way of of yeah, doing that, and I agree hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, you you get what I mean, and um, uh, to me, I found that that was enormously beneficial for for my my art as well. For me, painting it's interesting because it's not a conscious exercise. So I find that because I'm not thinking about painting while I'm painting, mental bandwidth is now being spent chewing on other things, and frequently, if that is not controlled or directed, it will always go to the dark side to the, the guy in high school that um, sold me a bike for a hundred bucks, but it was made out of pieces that he salvaged from the tip, to the thing that my jujitsu instructor told me, to Andrew, you're showing up for late, uh, late for work. And I was working on this shift at McDonald's and uh, my stepmother ironed my pants in such a way that I felt slightly embarrassed about where the creases were. Like ridiculous crap that your mind just goes, da -da 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 -da. and so I find that the meditation was something that really helped um, by just going, hang on a second, you are not your thoughts. You don't need to identify with this mental chatter. That's not you. That's, that's just a voice in the dark that can be ignored. But now I found more and more, it's interesting, more and more now that voice is, is it depends on which day you ask me, but it's, it's getting, it appears to be getting louder. And again, back to the social media thing, it's my addiction to the social media and my need to feel like I'm connected there, which causes me to, to go back into that headspace. The only way that I've been able to manage it is with audiobooks that talk about positivity stuff, law of attraction stuff, business stuff, success stuff. I can't get into it with, I can't get into fiction. 
I don't want somebody telling telling me a story. I can't do it. Uh, but but I, I if you want to talk about business, I'll listen. <laughs> Which is weird, you know. That's funny. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, yeah, I'll definitely get stuck on the most weird and ridiculous thought loops. Um, but like, I think one of the crucial skills in life, like, and it's such a, it's such a sounds like something your dad would say. That's kind of why it's so. It's just that like sometimes you're you're in an experience and something about it just isn't great, but just like uh, just questioning the belief that that means you have to like panicking and wanting to get out. Like th this is one reason I like running is like for me the experience of running for the first ten minutes is something in my head just going this just doesn't feel good just stop just stop just don't run anymore just stop running just you know don't run like stop running like every few seconds it's like god this sucks running oh, i'm not enjoying it. Running. And, and just like yeah the training is just learning like that thought has no consequences because it doesn't have to mean that you stop running it's like discovering like you said, that it's insubstantial, that, that a thought like that will disappear on its own. You couldn't even hold on to it if you tried, actually. Thoughts are over as soon as they're done. And it's the same in painting. Like, yeah, sometimes I'll have a thought loop going on. It's driving me crazy, but, you know, it's just like I just will keep painting. Uh, in fact, almost to a point where I, I have to sort of, I mean, every day is different. Some days you'll... And that's the other thing as well. It's like, it's, you're never kind of done. It's very much like trying to get in shape or trying to eat healthy. It's not a, or anything in life. Nothing is ever like, well, I did that now. It's a continual, um, daily practice. And yeah. So even that kind of stuff, but yeah, I, I love doing like right now, my favorite. So I was into weightlifting a lot for years, like powerlifting stuff. Um, oh, great. Yeah. Wow. Me too. Yeah. So I got, I got my, I, th I think I, my strength peaks at 21 <laughs> I, I, or, I, or somehow um, it was around then I got like a, like a 230 kilo deadlift was like the heaviest and like a 190 squat. So it was wow. like, so I like got, I, I never got that 200 kilo squat that I wanted, got 195, but um, I had, the, I got the flu once. And then I was training back up and then I wanted to try out a vegetarian, no vegan diet for a while, which was good, but I was, you know, under eating as a lot of people did. And, and then I was getting my strength back up. And, um, and then I went through this long period of I started developing, like getting panic attacks and stuff and weird cardiophobia, like convinced I was going to have a heart attack all the time. And just, so for whatever reason, I, I slowly, just this year, I just realized like, uh, I just felt like doing something else with my body and I've like sort of thrown myself into climbing and, um, mm -hmm. I'm just loving climbing right now. Like it's oh, fantastic. kind of like what I'm thinking about half the time, but I think, yeah, if you, if you're going to spend a lot of your time sat down or drawing or whatever, you've got to find a way to, uh, do something fun to connect with your body. And I've heard from so many artists who get into their thirties. If you don't do that, that you, you get away with it for a while. And then just one day you're like, what did I do? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's not a moral thing. It's not like, it's not, it's not that it's, I just, I think for me, the mental health benefits of training, like, I, and I feel like it's important to find a training that you find fun and where your self-esteem is derived from what you're doing with your body, not like how you look. Cause I think that can be a real black hole of uh, body dysmorphia for people. So I think it's like, you, you want to find a form of training where you feel proud of the cool things that you're able to do with your body rather yeah. than. Yeah. Well, well, again, again, in that, in that circumstance, you're shifting the focus away from the external thing. In this case, it might be validation for how you physically look. You're taking the focus away from that to focusing on the process of getting into a daily habit. This is what we're doing today. And then you build from there. I mean, I, I found that again, and I've talked about this in the podcast before, that that physical exercise is something that, that, that feeds 
directly into the artwork and actually makes it, it makes it better. And the whole time that you're doing that, for me now, the thing that I'm really into, I, I've just now gotten back into weightlifting um, and, and long distance running and kettlebells. Um, yeah. and, and that's the thing that, that really, you just go and you, you empty the tank. You just, at the end of the day, I just yeah. go into that gym space. I turn oh, on, so I turn I on the, the, yeah, the playlist with nine inch nails and Led Zeppelin and all sorts. And I just, I empty the tank and then I, I, yeah. I'm, I it's that reset button, you know? I and, truly only experience like any inner peacefulness after like, constantly working out like like i sometimes feel like and my girlfriend's really good at spotting it now i'll be like really fretting she was just like you haven't been to the gym in a few days you should just go right now and then i'll come back and i'll be like oh it was just that like i was convinced the world was falling apart and the truth <laughs> oh, was wow. I, I really needed to just go like yeah no. you know get it out of my system and mm. oh yeah i mean to me, yeah everything i think of everything in terms of um yeah, everything is just an experience in consciousness. You know, that's really, I think, physical, mental, it's all just kind of interesting to me for how it, um, what it is like to go through that experience. And I, I love, I really love training. I love going and sort of trying to tap into that vicious chimp energy that I'm cursed with. But, you know, I can, feel, I can feel it inside of me sometimes. It's like when you're lifting weights, it's that desire to, to, to just push hard. And to, it's like pouring bleach onto your, for me, it's like all of these thoughts and my, I sometimes feel so tired and I go to the gym. And if I, 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 there's this deep anger in me that I, of all the random small inconveniences of the day, the, the time I hit my knee or that, that little thing that didn't go that well in the studio or just that I'm so annoyed at myself for feeling mopey and ungrateful and, and, and for being shitty in a conversation earlier where I couldn't listen properly. And this kind of desire to not be this lame version of myself that is just not fun to be around it makes me sort of mad enough to train kind of like a lunatic and then getting it out of my system, the feeling of just being like, Oh, like taking a big breath and relaxing. Like there's nothing I like more than the feeling of like, and it's like that you can do all the lazy shit as well. Like watching Netflix in bed feels so good. Eating some chips and hummus. If you've been drawing all day, did the things you had to do, gone to the gym. And then you, I feel like you can do the stuff that is really like tempting and alluring and like actually enjoy it instead of just feeling like it's, driving you further into discomfort. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. So you, Absolutely. You, you get to have cake. <laughs> <laughs> you get you get to have cake. You deserve the cake, Miles. Yes. You've done your best. I mean the, the proverbial cake. Have your cake. For sure. Eat it. For sure. Have your cake. Well, Miles, this has been a fantastic conversation, amazing conversation. Uh, you've caused me to explore some things that um I, I I do like to think about from time to time, but but at the same time, again, it's it's a lot like your artwork. It's this pointing at something and just and just really going into the heart of the issue. And I really appreciate that. I so appreciate your time. This has been tremendous. I, I'd like to wrap this up with a question that I pass off to many of my guests here on the Creative Endeavor. This might seem like a um, like a cheesy question, but I, I enjoy thinking about it because I often think about my past and the things that have happened along the way that have led me to the point where I am now. And if one thing was out of place, um, I, I, I kind of would, I, I fear where I would be. I'm not, I'm not too sure how it would have turned out. But um, if you had the opportunity to go back and talk to your 10-year-old self, what advice would you give him and, and why? Wow. Mm. No one has ever asked me that. <laughs> um, I very strongly relate to you in the sense that I feel like, um, I feel like I, I feel like everything that has happened, I'm quite happy with how it's turned out. I feel like I have to, I have to imagine that there are other lives I'm also satisfied with, but I, I honestly feel like I would be too afraid to even get involved. But if I, I mean, 
you know, what would I say? Uh, love is the only truly <laughs> valuable thing. I don't know, connecting with other people. I think I would just tell them to uh, worry a bit less about um, things out of my control. I've wasted too much time uh, on things that just never came to any kind of fruition, things I didn't need to worry about. But at the same time, beginning to understand that has only come from going through that. Sure. I, and it's such an unsatisfying answer, but I, ha I have, I just leave him alone. I might just buy him an ice cream in Perfect. a non creepy way. I would just like, <laughs> I mean, it would be so, man, that'd be the ultimate trip. Can you imagine actually staring at sitting across from 10 year old you? That would be truly bizarre. But um, no, he, he got lucky. I'm just telling him he got lucky and to be a little more grateful, maybe. I don't know. I, I, you know, personally, I've seen too many time travel movies that I, I think I would hesitate as well to get involved and say anything yeah. <laughs> in case it changes the, the, the path, you know. I'd worry uh, if he looked at me and, and even had the thought, is that me? I'd screw mm. him up for life. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> not really. Paranoid schizophrenic. Yeah. No, I don't know. Yeah, and I want to just say thank you very much. I appreciate your time as well. It's been a really fun conversation. And I appreciate people's... Uh, what patience in my semi-tired state. I feel, I wish I could have been a little clearer on some things, but I think you get an idea of what I'm interested in. And Absolutely. Hopefully something to think about, but um, yeah, yeah, I don't want to leave anyone with a sense of heaviness. I'm ultimately, there's a phrase from that Victor Frankl book, tragic optimism. Mm -hmm. I feel I'm deep, deeply optimistic about the nature of life and reality. I think it is inherently a good thing to exist. I, um, I just feel like a real, you know, I got a bit of that existential streak. I feel like real happiness is what you find after you've kind of faced the bad news of, uh, you know, really understanding our, our situation and where we are and what kind of world this is. But I feel like um, I find I'm excited, I'm inspired and just here for the ride really. And, um, I think every, I think it's beautiful what you're doing. I think there's nothing for me. There's my favorite thing that it's like happened. It's been having a central, the thing that ultimately I love about art is having a practice to kind of build your life and routine around. And, um, yeah. And, and just the self-esteem that comes from, from that, I think is, is truly like the most important thing. Cause you mm -hmm. take that into every, every moment, you know, having some security with yourself, that is like, um, something you can't buy, something you can't fake. And, um, yeah, just undoubtedly a good thing, but, uh, yeah. So everyone out there, if this is something you want to do with your life, you can totally do it. And I would say if you're really feeling stuck, just start with that commitment to practice, you know, rig the game in a way that you can win. Like if you're truly stuck, like draw for an hour every other day or 20 minutes a day, start with something that you can't fail. And once that becomes normal, build from there. And people overestimate what they can do in a day and underestimate what they can do in a year. So just really focus on what kind of habits you can build and sustain over a long time. And those are the things that are going to really make a huge difference to your art. You know, it's no use like binging, studying for 10 hours one day and then being too tired to do anything for a week. It's so much better to figure out like and just have the patience to figure out where you're at, what you can do today, this week. And man, there's just so many fun experiences down the line if you want to get into creating stuff. Hmm. Miles, thank you so much for joining me on this episode of The Creative Endeavor. I've really enjoyed it keep listening to the creative endeavor <laughs> shout out creative endeavor <laughs> no, thank you very much i've enjoyed it now i really hope that you've enjoyed this episode of the creative endeavor podcast and if you did then please hit that like button for me and leave me a comment down below 
If you want to come back for more and see more episodes of The Creative Endeavor, my new Sketch Endeavor series, or some of my YouTube painting tutorials, then make sure you're subscribed to this channel and hit that notification icon so you're notified when I upload another video. As always, you can find me on Instagram and Facebook, but most important, make sure you're subscribed through my website. Simply go to www.andrewtischler.com slash subscribe into your name and email address there, and I'm in touch with my subscribers regularly. And might I add, it's free to do so. So I look forward to seeing you there. Thanks so much for stopping by, and I'll see you again soon.